The purpose of this morning's meeting is to begin a series of engagements on reform of the family law system. From University <coughs> College Cork, we are joined by Dr. Conor O'Mahony, Senior Lecturer in Constitutional and Child Law. From the Children's Rights Alliance, we are joined by Ms. Saoirse Brady, Legal and Policy Director, and Ms. Julia Hearn, Access to Justice Manager. From the Law Society of Ireland, we are joined by Mr. Keith Walsh, Chairman of the Family and Child Law Committee, and Ms. Helen Cotland, also a member of the committee. And from the Rape Crisis Network Ireland, we are joined by Dr. Cleanna Sandlier, Executive Director, and Ms. Caroline Cunahan, Legal Director. And you're all very welcome, and I will shortly invite you to make your opening statements. And if it's in order, I'll <coughs> introduce you in the order in which I've just read out your, your presence. But first, I must draw your attention to the situation in relation to privilege. Please note that you were protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you were to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You were directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you were asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that were possible. You should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her or it identifiable. And members of the committee should be aware that under the salient rulings of the chair, members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So, in that case, I would now propose to invite Dr. Mahoney to make the first opening statement. Thank you. Uh, I was the Thank you very much for the invitation to address you here today. Uh, my statement will focus on two of the issues uh, which were suggested for discussion, uh, namely the obligation to ascertain the views of children <coughs> excuse me, and the structure of the court system. Uh, and as I will explain, I see these two issues as being uh, closely connected to each other. Now, as a question of policy, the obligation to ascertain the views of children uh, during family law proceedings has already been settled. It's a matter of international human rights law to which Ireland has subscribed and it's also a matter of Irish constitutional law. Uh, Article 42A of the Constitution requires that in family law cases uh, the views of all children who are capable of forming views shall be ascertained and given due weight uh, in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. So that initial question has been settled. However, Article 42A is not self-executing. Its implementation is dependent upon legislation. Um, and unfortunately, since Article 42A came into effect in 2015, uh, the legislative response of the Iraq this has been, I would argue, rather timid. Article 42A is mandatory. Uh, it requires that every child who is capable of forming views should have their views ascertained uh, in family law proceedings. Um, however, when we look at the family law legislation which implements it, we have at the moment an uneven and patchwork approach uh, to the question of whether children get to participate in family law proceedings. Uh, there are different rules applicable to different types of family law cases, uh, and those rules often afford significant discretion to courts as to whether or not to ascertain the views of children. So essentially, whether a child is afforded the opportunity to be heard uh, depends at the moment on what the case is about, where it is being heard, uh, which judge is hearing it, and who is paying the costs. And that is a far cry from what the Constitution uh, states should happen. In my written submission, I itemise the form that this difficulty takes in various areas, including child protection cases, uh, private family law cases, international child abduction cases, and adoption cases. Uh, and the issues essentially revolve around the question of how much discretion courts have to decide whether or not to hear from children, and also the question of who pays the costs of appointing a guardian ad litem or an expert to convey the views of the child. So, in summary, on that point, I think it's clear that we do need to engage in significant legislative reform across the wide spectrum of different family law cases to ensure that what that legislation provides matches the constitutional obligation in Article 42A. 
But while legislative reform is a necessary step, it is not a sufficient step. Uh, it's important to emphasise that the, an, another significant obstacle to effective child participation is uh, the child friendliness or lack of child friendliness of Irish courts at present. Uh, we have significant evidence, and I cite uh, some of this in my written submission, uh, that the environment in Irish courts at present is not a child friendly environment and acts as a significant barrier to child participation. So legislative reform on the mechanisms for hearing children by itself uh, is likely to encounter an implementation gap unless we also address the structure of the courts. Now, there's been multiple calls for the establishment of specialist family courts in Ireland uh, for a long period of time now, dating back to a detailed Law Reform Commission report in 1996. So, as far back as 1996, the Commission identified multiple problems relating to inadequate physical facilities, the absence of specially trained judges, um, around inconsistency between courts and decision making, and around excessive caseloads. And the Commission made a series of recommendations to address that, which in, to in their totality really moved in the direction of establishing specialist family courts. Those recommendations have not been implemented, uh, and in the years since then, there's been multiple calls for the implementation of those recommendations, including by the Law Society, who are here today, by the Government's Special Rapporteur on Child Protection, Dr Geoffrey Shannon, by Dr Carl Coulter and the Child Care Law Reporting Project, and also by the UCC Child Care Proceedings Research Group, of which I was a member. Uh, more broadly, if we look at European trends, the trend in Europe is towards specialisation in the area of family law among judges and courts. Now, there's two quick points to emphasise on that. The first is that uh, separation is not so much the key as specialisation. Having a separate court doesn't work unless you also have specialisation among judges and staff within that court. And we have evidence from Australia that illust illustrates that if family courts are, are staffed by judges who are not specially trained in child and family law, that uh, their effectiveness is limited. Conversely, uh, it's important to, uh, to emphasise that there does need to be separation in that uh, the scope for what you can achieve within the general court system is somewhat limited uh, for the reason that, uh, first of all, judges who also deal with other kinds of cases are not incentivised to significantly upskill in the area of child and family law, and secondly because child and family law has a history in many jurisdictions of being a poor relation when it comes to resource allocation of court time, physical facilities and so on. So separation is also important in that respect. Now, two final points. One is just to, to say that there are some issues that would need to be uh, considered around how do you achieve this outside of major population centres. Uh, so obviously it's easier to do this in Dublin or Cork than it is in rural areas. Uh, but there are models from other jurisdictions such as Queensland where they have, a, have established a mix of regional centres and travelling judges which can overcome that particular difficulty. And again, that there is references to that in my written submission. The final point I would make is that the establishment of a specialist family court does not require a constitution amendment. That has been suggested on various occasions, but if you look at something like the designation of the District Court as the Children Court, for example, for juvenile justice matters under the Children Act of 2001 and other examples, it is clear that it is possible to do this by way of ordinary legislation, and that legislation could then specify the characteristics that a specialist court would have. Uh, so my written submission has more detail on all of those points, and I'll be very happy to take questions on that later on. Thank you for Thank your you, attention. Dr. Thank you, Thank you. I'd now like to, on behalf of the Law Society, am I right in saying, Mr Walsh, Keith, are you going yes. to lead off? Uh, I'm going to lead off and then my colleague who's the Vice Chair, Helen Coughlin, will uh, come in with a couple of just very practical examples. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you, thank you, Chairperson. Um, the Law Society, first of all, welcomes the, the opportunity to uh, add its voice uh, to the calls uh, for referral form and also to contribute positively uh, towards that. Um, one or two points initially are that I think everybody is more or less agreed that the current family law system is broken and is not working properly and what we need to do is to reform it immediately. There seems to be a huge degree of unanimity, unanimity in terms of a specialist, not a separate, but a specialist um, cadre of or division of the courts to deal with family law. And uh, I think the Law Society, we've set out in our detailed 2014 paper and in our submission today what we believe should happen. None of this is news to anybody here or anyone involved in family law because we've been calling for action and all the groups here have been calling for action for uh, almost the 20 years since the Law Reform Commission uh, um, published their report on the family law courts. Um, 
the, the, I suppose the first issue that um, we want to raise is the, the issue arising from the uh, problems with security on the 20th of December in the Circuit Family Court where, where there was um, somebody w was able to uh, compromise the security of a courtroom and, and there were issues arising. That highlighted really the, the complete inadequacy of the Circuit Family Law um, uh, Court in Dublin. And there's also a huge issue with the childcare courts in the old Bridewell or Victorian criminal courts. So parents and children who are attending in public law cases, which is where the uh, TUSLA or the CFA are, at, are um, bringing an application to have the child taken into, into uh, care, have to go to a, a Victorian prison where the acoustics are very difficult to hear and where the uh, environment and atmosphere is completely unsuitable for adults uh, and even more unsuitable for children were, were they to be there. Um, so the, certainly the premises of the courts, the physical premises need to change, the structure of the courts need to change. The Law Society agrees that if the specialist court uh, system uh, that is uh, proposed were taken up, it wouldn't require a constitutional uh, um, referendum to change it. Um, the other issue the Law Society has is with the Child and Family Relationships Act 2015, which gave effect to the change to Article 42A of the Constitution. That was hugely welcomed by the Law Society, and it's been implemented by Law Society members in district courts around the country and circuit courts. The difficulty is that no resources were allocated to give effect to the voice of the child. So we have a Rolls-Royce piece of legislation uh, with uh, basically no uh, resources attached to it. So district court judges are attempting to hear the voice of the child without the assistance of any experts, without the assistance of any uh, huge uh, funding from the court service. Uh, there's been a recent uh, regulation which the Law Society is concerned about which fixes uh, the cost of a, uh, an expert report into the voice of the child or the welfare of the child under Section 32 of the 2015 Act at 250 or 300 euros. That will mean that experts won't do these reports because the reports typically involve at least four visits to the family and to the parents to determine what will happen. They're reports that will be cross-examined in court, so there may also be an attendance at court. And they're also, in addition to that, uh, the person will have to, the expert will have to produce the report. So certainly uh, at least 20 hours will have to go into that report and to, to ask somebody to do a report and potentially to give evidence in relation to it uh, means that people won't do that. Uh, the current system is that judges in, in the district court may hear uh, the voice of the child in person from the child. Uh, the, the facilities for that are completely inadequate. The training is is there on a patchwork basis, but it also means that the judges are taken from their normal work as well. So from a resource point of view, it's not efficient at all. Uh, the Law Society says that a specialist division of family law courts and judges would greatly assist in dealing with family law cases more efficiently, as it would be likely that the same judges would be available to deal with cases which appear regularly before the courts, and a greater degree of consistency would be established. It's been noted elsewhere that judges should not be confined to this speci speciality, but should be general judges who could be assigned to family law but would nece not necessarily spend all their judicial uh, career in family law, but they would have to be uh, trained and spend a sufficient time there as well. So um, we say that more focus should be pay placed on settling cases earlier on in the process. Obviously an exception is domestic violence where cases may not be able to be uh, settled or may not be uh, suitable for ADR, but very active intervention in family law cases by judges, not by county registrars, who are currently the court officials who deal with it or other officials with an emphasis on resolution and ADR could result in significant savings of time resources for all concerned. Now ADR obviously happens before people get to court as well because of the new Mediation Act and the provisions in the uh, Family Law and the Divorce Act. The Legal Aid Board appears chronically underfunded and it's not economically possible for solicitors to make a living from the private practitioner scheme of the Legal Aid Board, which has led to a flight of solicitors from the District Court uh, where it currently operates. One of the questions we were asked today was about a dedicated uh, court system and could, uh, would, that, um, would that remedy the issues? And we say that a dedicated uh, family law court structure throughout the 
the country would fix many of the problems currently faced, but only if it was properly resourced. The family law court system needs to be integrated with ADR alternative dispute resolution and the legal aid board as well would need to be there in the courthouses providing facilities not only for courts but also for ADR and for the legal aid board. Proper premises would need to be provided for in the family law courts. If it was simply a case of creating a family law division within existing structures, then we say a referendum would not be required. Equally, the changes to the district and circuit court would require some consideration. Uh, we also have put up alternatives to this model, but from a practical point of view, and in order to move this forward, given the consensus in relation to the specialist courts, we fully support uh, the calls for a specialist court and would like to see that implemented sooner rather than later. The, the issue of costs also arises, and we've set out our views in relation to the costs, and we say the best way to look at the issue of costs and whether cost orders could be used, if you like, to punish bad behaviour is to encourage settlement at every possible opportunity to increase the case management and to have cost order potentially as a punishment for those who insist on going ahead of, with their cases when a very fair offer has been made by the other side and that they are likely to do better in court. But where people insist on proceeding, which uses up a valuable court time and also increases costs on both sides, there should be some sanction available to the court. Uh, there's a thing called a Calder Bank letter, which effectively means that you set out your position in writing and that can be used uh, subsequently for an order for costs. That should be considered, but it should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. We, we again call for consistent judicial supervision of cases to ensure that uh, alternative dispute resolution is considered before you go to court, when you go to court, when you're at the start of the court process and at every stage along the court process so that it is dealt with by a judge and there's a lot more active case management, we, result, we believe that would be a much more efficient use of resources and would also lead to cases being resolved much earlier for the parties in the majority of cases. Some cases are simply too acute to settle, but certainly very active judicial uh, case management, we believe, would, would, would work. Um, I suppose the le we say that legal aid has not kept abreast of developments in the complexity of, law, of the law, the needs of the clients or what it involves to defend and represent a client and the resourcing of legal aid is very important. The final point I suppose I'm going to make on behalf of the Law Society is just in relation to the rights of fathers and I suppose the Law Society Family Law and Child Law Committee is composed of people who do this work every day of the week and are in a variety of courts and we rep represent the solicitors who act for for parents whose children may be taken into care. We, we have people who act for the health board. We have people who do divorce and separation every day, who are down in the district court every day. So we have a wide variety of people who are practically in the courts. And I suppose what we have seen is that um, the, the, the current access model does not necessarily work particularly for fathers, it definitely doesn't work for children, and that we maybe need to do some research to see how does access currently work in the courts. The, the, the model of every second weekend with an overnight on a Wednesday is kind of the standard default access uh, for fathers in a lot of cases, and particularly where there's accommodation uh, problems in Dublin, we, we see that access is a genuine issue and there's genuine hardship cause for children and for families because of that. So, uh, in summary, we say that what we would like to see is action in relation to this, that there's been plenty of discussion up to now. We really do need a change. The change can be introduced by legislation, but legislation is no good on its own. We actually need resources to back it up whatever changes are made. And I'll just hand over to Helen to deal with a couple of very practical examples of, of the problems. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to deal with the practical implications of the delays that are currently um, in the system. Um, I work as a family law solicitor in Kildare and if somebody came in to see me today looking for maintenance or looking for access, I will submit an application to the court. It will be four months before that application will first come before the court. It goes before the court as for mention only. So unless it has resolved, it will then be put into a further list a further four months down the road. So the person who comes in to me today, conceivably, it could be October before that matter is adjudicated on in court. That is the situation in Kildare. And there are equal delays around the country, according to the court service. In Letterkenny, you would be waiting 13 weeks. Carlo, you would be waiting 12 weeks. Wexford, six to eight weeks. 
um, Dundalk four weeks. And those figures are from 2017, so I, I, I haven't seen any more up-to-date figures. And that's if you have the resources to go into a private practitioner. If you are going to the Legal Aid Board, even before you can get your application off the ground, you will face delays in even seeing a solicitor for the first, for the first consultation. So, for example, in Blanchardstown at the moment, there is a 44-week delay before you will actually see a solicitor. Um, if you're in Ennis, it's 21 weeks. If you're in Wexford, it's eight weeks. Wicklow, it's 17 weeks. So that is before you even get your application into court. That's just to see a solicitor initially to get advice. Um, so that, there is a very serious issue in terms of access to justice. And those delays in practical terms mean that parents may not be seeing their children, parents may not be getting suitable financial resources for their children. And um, my, my colleague Mr Walsh mentioned about the childcare and the facilities in uh, Chancery Street. The childcare uh, facilities are, are heard in uh, Chancery Street at the moment. And this was the old Bridewell. And the um, hearings where the most vulnerable people are before the court, where their children will be taken into care by the state. They are downstairs in what is equivalent to what the dungeons were. That is where the family law um, childcare is heard at the moment. So certainly we are not serving the most vulnerable in society at the moment with the facilities that we have. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Mr Walsh, both. And I actually um, skipped the order in which I intended to introduce each of the speakers, and I apologise, Saoirse. Okay. <laughs> um, I had indicated that I would uh, stick to the listing as I had introduced you all at the start. But I now would like to invite um, Ms Brady and Ms O'Hearn to offer the Children's Rights Alliance contribution this morning. Okay, thank you. Thank and I'll you. split the time with uh, Julie. I'll hand over to her in a moment. Um, we just want to thank the committee for this opportunity to come here today. Um, we feel it's a very timely uh, hearing to look at family law matters because of recent reforms that have taken place, but also the urgent need for further reform. And I think we'll echo a lot of what our other colleagues have said already. Um, the Children's Rights Alliance unites over 100 members who work together to make Ireland one of the best places in the world to be a child. We change the lives of all children by ensuring that their rights are respected and protected in our laws, uh, policies and services. And we also provide legal information and advice to children, young people and their families through our newly established informa legal information line. Um, and we also offer legal advice, outreach clinics nationwide as well. So um, that will inform some of what we have to say today as well. Um, we're going to focus on two key aspects, like Dr O'Mahony. We're going to focus on the role of children in family law proceedings, particularly around the voice of the child, and the need to reform the family law courts structures to meet the needs of children and young people in particular. So the family law courts have not been designed to meet the needs of children and families who are often embroiled in difficult family law disputes. The physical environment does not provide them the necessary space and privacy to deal with very sensitive and private family matters. Judges are making decisions in courts around the country about intimate family law issues, often in the same room as they decide um, or they hear issues around you know, driving offences, for example. Despite the fact that most proceedings involving children are subject to the in-camera rule, we've heard from lawyers about the lack of privacy in court settings. You know, they're giving legal advice in stairwells and corridors and not in, in private consultation rooms, never mind child-friendly consultation rooms. Um, ch children who are present in court also often witness um, disturbing or upsetting or even sometimes violent behaviour. So, so that needs to be addressed as well. But there is guidance out there on how we can actually adapt um, our, our structures to make them more child friendly. So the Council of Europe has issued child friendly justice guidelines that provide that states should ensure that, that these matters take place, that any, any matters involving children take place in non-intimidating and child sensitive settings. So, they call for um, interviewing and waiting rooms for children 
to be provided in a child-friendly environment. They said that children should be familiarised with the court setting, the layout, the roles um, and identities of the officials ahead of the actual proceedings so that they know what's going on, that they understand what's happening and that court sessions involving children should be adapted to the child's pace and attention span with planned regular breaks and you know, that they are limited in duration so that children can properly participate. Um, we recommend as a priority the development of suitable accommodation for children and young people in the courts. A key aspect of this would be progressing Hammond Lane um, and the dedicated children and family courts that we've been promised for so long. In developing and designing the new family courts, all stakeholders should be consulted, and this includes legal professionals, families and those who work to support them. But most importantly, children and young people should be consulted. This has happened before, you know, with the Children's Court um, and, you know, other, other experts should be brought in. So, for example, in the <coughs> Criminal Courts of Justice, Bernardo's were actually invited in to help design the child-friendly spaces there. Um, and we, we would recommend that that is done in this instance as well. Um, as Dr Mahoney has said, in Ireland, most child and family law cases are heard by generalist judges in the general court system. However, specialised family or children's court systems are commonplace in, you know, across Europe and in other common law jurisdictions, um, where there are specially designed court facilities and the judiciary and lawyers have specialised training. We have also seen good examples elsewhere. So, for example, um, in, in the UK, Mr Justice Peter White, um, he actually wrote a letter in plain English, inaccessible language, to a 14-year-old involved in a custody case. Um, and, and, and it was so unique, I suppose, that it made news headlines. Um, he also wrote a, a, a judgment in emojis for very young children to help them understand what was going to happen to them in a way that they found accessible. Um, so, so we think we could you know, look to some of these examples and try and adapt them here. We recommend that in, in introducing any family law reform, specialised training is provided for all professionals working in the family law courts, and these should reflect child-friendly justice principles. And really, we do need training on, you know, so that our judges, um, our lawyers, and everyone involved in the family law proceedings know how to effectively communicate with children and young people. I will now pass you over to my colleague Julia Hearn, who will talk about the role of children in proceedings a bit further. Thank you. Thank you. In addressing the role of children in proceedings, I am going to focus on two key issues. Firstly, I am going to talk about the voice of the child in family law proceedings, and then I am going to talk about the provision of information to children and families. So, moving first to the voice of the child, the right of the child to be heard is one of the fundamental values under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the child friendly justice principles that Saoirse mentioned earlier also provide that judges should respect the views of children and their right to be heard in all matters affecting them. And importantly, they also recommend that children should be consulted about the manner in which they want to be heard. So, it shouldn't just be assumed that children should be heard by one particular manner or another. They should be asked how they would like to have their voices listened to. They also set out that children should not be presumed not be, be able to give their views based solely on their age. And in fact, we should look at children's level of maturity and understanding. And I think everyone in the room knows two 12-year-olds who would be very different in their, in their understanding of what is going on in life and what is going on in a particular situation. So it's important that we look at the individual child and not just make a blanket kind of, I suppose, assumption of someone's capacity based on their age. Dr Romani has very kindly outlined the uh, Irish, Irish legal position in relation to hearing the voice of children. And I suppose what we want to highlight in particular is the Children and Family Relationships Act. And the Act for the first time placed an obligation on ju ju judges to hear the views of children when they're determining what is in the best interest of the child. What is really important for people to remember, though, is that the Act is not prescriptive about the way in which children's voices can be heard. There is a variety of ways in which children's voices are currently heard and can be heard. This can include hearing them in chambers by the judges, hearing them in open court if appropriate, and, if needs be, bringing in an expert that can help the, help the court elicit what their views are. And we would like to note that Professor Geoffrey Shannon, in his most recent Special Rapporteur report, did outline that we should consider bringing in guidelines for how judges can interact with children and young people in family law cases. I hear directly from children and young people on our legal information line and from their families that they feel that their views are not adequately being heard in the family law system. I get calls from children themselves, from mothers, from fathers, who feel that the courts are not listening to what children have to say. In when they're coming into court. And similar to the Law Society, the Children's Rights Alliance would actually be very concerned about some of the provisions of the regulations on child's views experts. In particular, we are very concerned that the regulations place a burden on families to pay for the experts to hear the views of children. 
And what we, what, we, what we will see as this plays out, and what we think we will see as this plays out, is the families who can afford to, have the, to, to employ a child's views expert will have their voices heard, but children whose families can't, won't. So the right to the child is actually going to be dependent on their parents' ability to pay. We also would echo the views of the Law Society in that the cap placed on the child's view expert is incredibly low. What we will find is that in very complex cases there will be no experts willing to take on the position. And this we are very concerned about because children in the most vulnerable situations will potentially not have their right to be heard vindicated. Moving on then to the second point which is in relation to information provided to children and families. Again, I hear every day from children and families that they do not know what the process is in the family law courts. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what's going on. They want to know information about their rights, how they go into the court, how they navigate the process. Basic information what, that they want going into what is a really unfamiliar and scary environment, particularly if you are a child or a young person who has never before walked into a courtroom. And the Council of Europe Child Friendly Justice Guidelines again have been very helpful in, in setting out what information should be provided to children. This should include information on their rights, on, their, on the system, how it works, what their role will be and any support mechanisms. And the last one in particular is very important because if children, young people and families are supported, they would hopefully find the process a lot easier to navigate and a lot, I suppose, a lot less traumatic in terms of going through the system. We think consideration should be given to providing information to children and families, and that is child-friendly, adapted to the needs of the families and the age and maturity of the child. Consideration should also be given to employing digital technology and making the information widely accessible. While there is some very good information around and out there, what I find is families, they either want, and children in particular, they either want to get information from someone they know and trust, or they look online. And if you do a quick Google online and you try to find information about how the family law process works, it is very difficult to understand and as people working in the area I'm even going what is this meant to mean so I think it's very important that it's very accessible that people can find in their own right but also that it's there for people who work with them to guide them through the process another method that could be considered to provide support is the employment of a specialist court liaison officer this would be a person who children and families could go to they could get information and be someone that could be there and should can support them going through what is a really difficult process which is going through the family law courts um, we, would recommend, we would recommend that this could be considered in, any, in any, any proposed change in the family law system and we would, we would recommend priorita prioritisation in particular of information to children and young people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Julie. Thank you for that. And Cleana, uh, on behalf of Rape Crisis Network Ireland, would you like to start the opening session if Caroline wishes to come in to, uh, at any point? I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation um, to speak to the Commission today on the reform of the family law system. RCNI recognises the expert detail and detailed consideration given to the issues of interest to this committee by our peers here today and in the last 12 months in, in, in reports in particular the, the Garden Inspectorate Report, the Child Care Law Reporting Project, HICWA and the Child Rapporteur. Rather than repeat them, I will focus today on RCNI's particular area of expertise and specialist concern, sexual violence, and in this context, the child victim of familial sexual abuse and incest. Um, we have three priorities. The establishment of a specialist family court, as, as our peers have all advocated for. Transparency and accountability of our child protection system, including family law systems. Um, the development of a national strategy on child sexual violence. Child sexual violence is a crime, not, a, not just a civil matter. However, in, civil, in sexual violence and incest, very often the criminal justice system fails, and the protection of these children can become the subject of the family law courts, both publicly and privately. Tusla receives approximately 3,000 referrals of child sexual abuse per annum. The number of children concerned will be fewer. I'd invite you to consider what happens to those 3,000 reports. International in-depth studies of disclosures from whatever source of sexual violence committed against children allows us to stay, say that we can expect some false allegations at a rate of approximately 2% to 8%, with the lowest rate of false allegations being de 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 detected for the child who discloses themselves. In, in accordance with the law and protocols, all cases are notified to Angarda Sheikhana. Difficulties, difficulties with these protocols are detailed in the specialist report cited above and are part of the implementation plan arising, in particular from the Garden Inspectorate report. I don't propose to dwell on these matters here. So according to the Garden Inspectorate, for, the, for these cases there is a 4% prosecution rate. 
with less than 2% resulting in a criminal conviction, less than 2%. Therefore, our criminal justice failure rate in reported and true child sexual violence is between 90% and 96%. For these children, risks need to be managed and they need protection regardless of the absence of a criminal conviction. The protection of these children is one of the complex tasks we expect families and communities to undertake informally and which the legislature have mandated Tusla to undertake formally on all our behalf. In the course of this work, Tusla relies on the Family Law Courts for some of its actions, such as applications for care orders. In addition, these cases arise in private family law because for many children, the, the family is not a safe place. The family is the location of harm. The inspector's report, which was finished in December 2017, found that in 44% of child sexual violence cases, the alleged perpetrator was a family member. When we look at different age cohorts within childhood, which the RCNI and I did in our national statistics in 2015, I can tell you that in 62% of all 13 cases of child sexual violence, they were reported as perpetrated within the family. 62%. For many of these families where a child discloses incest, some but not all will result in the family breaking up. This can be expected to be highly acrimonious, which in all likelihood will escalate into, into private family, family courts. This means that we can expect that a significant proportion of family separation and child custody cases going through our family courts involve the rape and sexual abuse of children by family members in the absence of a parallel criminal conviction. The family courts process, on average, 11,600 cases involving guardianship, custody and access matters. Both the Child Law Reporting um, Project and the Legal Aid Board have tried to estimate how many of these involve child sexual violence. RCNI believes this figure should not be a matter of a guesstimate. It should be possible, if novel, for court services to gather and release statistics on how many private family law cases involve allegations of child sexual abuse. We would recommend that the court services should gather and publish this information regularly as an imperative matter of justice and public interest. The fact is our family courts are handling highly criminal matters of the most sensitive and urgent child protection nature in unknown numbers, which without criminal authority, without the appropriate tools and the absence of appropriate specialisation, RCNI ad would, would advocate strongly for a special family law court which addresses these concerns. Such a court was recommended in 1996 by the Law Reform Commission and since then by the Child Rapporteur, uh, Child Care Law Reporting Project, amongst others. It is long overdue. As noted by the committee, the family law courts are held in camera. This means that apart from the very welcome Child Law Reporting Project and the work of the Rapporteur, there's little by way of gathering and collating of data to allow for the accountability and reassurance that we would need. A thorough review of how the in-camera report impacts transparency and accountability should be considered. In addition to the in-camera rule, confidentiality and non-disclosure clauses imposed on parties in the family courts do sometimes occur, whereby the court rules, amongst other things, that a child's disclosure of rape and sexual violence must not be reported to the state's investigative authorities and Garda Síochána directly, but must be instead mediated through appointed individuals or Tusla who will decide when a child's voice can be heard by our mandated criminal justice investigative authorities. There is no data or analysis generated by the court services or Tusla to make publicly transparent how many children and their guardians are bound by civil court ordered non-disclosure clauses. While we recognise the complexity of these cases, we would recommend that achieving greater transparency on these matters through court services data is a minimum for the discharge of oversight when such grave matters are at concern. Lastly, we would recommend that the committee add their voice to the call for an urgent child sexual violence national strategy that would ensure that the child victim of rape and most particularly of incest does not continue to be at risk of falling through the cracks. Until we increase our family courts and allied child protection structures, transparency and accountability and indeed specialisation, child, children and their voice remains disturbingly silent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth Kleene. And uh, to all our uh, witnesses this morning, thank you very much, not only for your um, contributions so far, but the written submissions that are very, very helpful. And before bringing in members, I have it to say that uh, we have made this the substantive issue for address in the first session of uh, this, this year's Dáil sittings. And we have scheduled three hearings, of which this is the first. And just listening to your respective contributions here this morning, I think that without question, 
uh, our own knowledge and exposure uh, to the issue that influenced our making this decision, uh, if anything has not fully appreciated how absolutely awful the situation is. And you have underscored that very, very well indeed. So the following members have indicated they wish to speak, Deputy Jim O'Callaghan, <coughs> Deputy McWallace and Senator Frances Black. So Deputy Jim O'Callaghan, yeah, please. Thanks very much, Chairman, and thank you all very much for uh, coming in this morning. Uh, just so as you're aware of what the process is here, we're going to produce a report and uh, obviously it's an area of some complexity, but that's why we need expertise in, to assist us in uh, preparing that report. Like, there's a lot of agreement between you, I think, on some fundamental areas, uh, but I think it's also worth pointing out that you know, family law is legitimately regarded as different to the determination and resolution of other disputes, like other disputes which are before the courts can affect, I suppose, one part of a, a person's rights or life, but family law disputes seem to involve uh, orders being made by the court which fundamentally affect the personal relationships that somebody has in their life. So it's, you know, it's of unique, I would have thought, importance in terms of the consequence that uh, a family law proceeding will have on people uh, and obviously on the family as well. Can I just uh, start at the outset by asking a few questions about um, Article 42A of the Constitution and its implementation through the Child and Family Relationships Act. And I know what you said, Connor, about obviously everyone agrees that we have to uh, try to ascertain the views of the child. But in practical terms, I don't know if Keith or Helen, who are practitioners, could they assist us. In practical terms, has that increased the amount of work uh, in a family law case whereby now you have to ascertain the views of every child? And if it has, how is it done practically? It, it varies greatly from district to district and currently the structure of the district court in Ireland is that every county uh, has its own district so you ultimately have around 26 districts. Uh, each district is each district court judge is not um, really answerable to the president of the district court so they're completely a law unto themselves. A specialist court system would allow maybe more of a whip in terms of that to some degree or certainly a degree of consistently. So how the voice of the child is heard differs from in Dolphin House, there are three judges sitting today who are dealing with access and custody issues. Depending on which judge, you might get three different uh, views on, the, on the, how the voice of the child can be heard. One way the voice of the child can be heard is actually through the evidence of the parents as to what they say. Another way is an expert report. Another way is the judge maybe in chambers uh, speaks to the child. That is the least used in, in, in my experience because of the time involved and also the, the lack of training. District court judges are far more likely than circuit court judges to hear children in chambers. Circuit court judges really, really don't get involved in that, whereas the district court would. Um, if you like, the referendum um, 42A, it's, it's about hearing the voice of the child, but the most important thing is that the uh, welfare of the child is to be paramount in any uh, proceedings involving custody, access or guardianship and also adoption matters. Um, so if there's, if there's a dispute about what's in the best interest or the best welfare of the child uh, and the, the, the parent's evidence is going to be very different in relation to it, you, you really do need to bring in an expert. And it's quite difficult to... Um, hear the voice of the child without an expert. And I think in the district court, what's happened is uh, there's a lot of constitutional and legislative um, imperatives on the district court judge without any resources. So these experts simply are not there to do the reports. Okay. So say you have a, you've a dispute involving a couple and they have, say, five children. How and the children are capable of having their views ascertained? Like in terms of your practical uh, experience, how is that done? Is it done by uh, affidavits by the children? Do they no, give no, oral not, evidence not, not, not or at all. Is it expert report? It, it, it would, would, should be an expert report, but in terms of, if you like, if you wanted to get an expert report, what we said in our submission is previously what would happen before the 2015 Act is you'd go into court and you'd probably get dealt with on the first date unless there was a formation yeah. uh, type way. Currently, if you go in in Dublin, you'd have to apply for the report on the first day. 
you might go back to another day to get the report, then you go back to another day to figure out how long it's going to take and can it be agreed. So before you get anywhere, you have four court dates, you've appeared on the list four times, and you haven't even got a hearing date. At the hearing date, the expert will probably give evidence if there's a conflict uh, between, as there will have to be. Because obviously, if you have two parents, the expert is not necessarily going to uh, solve the problem okay. and generally so uh, the 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 way we read it that the 2015 act uh, says it is that there has to be the voice of the child has to be heard and generally that will be done by way of expert report okay. i don't know helen do you have to um, in practical terms what it comes down to is resources if a family can afford to get an expert report okay. they will get it they cost in the region of three or four thousand euro, yeah. from my experience. The latest legislation is allowing 250 euro for the preparation of that report. So I can't see any of the experts doing it for 250 euro, to be honest with you. But in practical terms, to hear the vo voice of the child, it really depends on the judge who is sitting on the day and then, you know, whether they want to hear the children. Generally, if the facility to have an expert to elicit that view, um, from my experience, if a judge has that facility, they will take it. Okay, so there's no consistency really across no. the board as to how the view of the child is ascertained? Not at all. And am I correct in stating that this, uh, obviously the constitutional provision, which we all support, and its legislative uh, enactment basis, has um, lengthened and made family law proceedings probably more expensive and more complicated. If, if I could just at this point, I'd like maybe, I know that you had initially directed yeah, we'll your question to yeah. Dr. O'Mahony, yeah. and maybe he could offer his initial response and maybe take up on that point, and then the other uh, colleagues can pick it up then. Please, just, just briefly to, to address the question of, of the expert and the, and the 2015 Act and the private family law proceedings in particular, there's a gap in the Act in the sense that, as outlined by the Children's Rights Alliance and the Law Society, uh, where costs have to be paid by the parties themselves and cannot be paid by the parties themselves, uh, and that means essentially an expert cannot be appointed. Uh, but the Act is silent on how do you ascertain the views of the child where there is no expert. Okay. Uh, and that, of course, leaves open the possibility that the views of the child simply aren't heard. Uh, now, if we contrast that, there are better approaches to this. If you look, for example, at the, uh, the Brussels II regulation on international child abduction cases, which requires the court to certify either that the child's views have been heard or the reasons why this has not occurred. The Child Care Amendment Bill of 2018, uh, which is currently working its way through the Oireachtas, has a provision which states that if, if a guardian ad litem is not to be appointed, then the court must state in open court the reasons why the guardian ad litem is not to be appointed, but more importantly, also state in open court how the views of the child will be ascertained instead. But that's missing at the moment from the 2015 Act, which leaves open the possibility that it simply doesn't happen. On the question of lengthening the proceedings and, and making them more expensive, I think that's inescapable. But this is what we are committed to. Yeah. And I think, you know, we either follow through on that commitment or the alternative is that we hold a referendum to repeal Article 42A and we withdraw from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. That's yeah. the alternative. Yeah, I know. Obviously, the failure here is that we haven't resourced the system sufficiently in order to take on board our extra responsibilities as a result of the constitutional change. In terms of the, uh, the costs of it, like, obviously... Um, Sometimes you, you can have an option in respect of litigation, but in family law, you don't really have an option. And I note, Helen, you spoke about the delay that exists for people who simply can't afford lawyers. But like, what is the quality, do you believe, of the legal representation that litigants get having gone down the legal aid board? And how do they cope with the delay in getting representation? For the... the uh, for just to get, the, the, to get legal advice. Like most people, I presume, uh, will find it very difficult to be able to afford to pay for solicitors and barristers in family law proceedings. And how do they then cope with that in terms of the delay with the appointment of a solicitor by the Legal Aid Board? I think it must have a huge impact on a family that if you are... A family is obviously in crisis if it's to do with marital break, relationship breakdown or there are issues in relation to seeing your children or getting financial support for your children. If you're waiting three, six months to even see a solicitor mm. in the Legal Aid Board, that obviously has to affect them very seriously. And what can be done to 
change that to greater resource the legal aid board? Certainly, the legal aid board needs to be needs to, needs to be resourced. They, they need to have more solicitors so that those delays in terms of even seeing a solicitor for the first consultation are reduced. There was a private practitioner scheme for dealing with matters in the district court in relation to custody access and maintenance. But from our experience, due to the fee structure that was put in place, that most private practitioners have actually, they don't, they don't do it anymore mm -hmm. because it's not cost effective for them to do so. So then that feeds back into the delays uh, with the solicitors who are employed by the Legal Aid Board, you know, to deal with cases. And are there state-funded mediators who are available to people <coughs> in family law proceedings? Yes, you can get free mediation in the, I think it's the Family Mediation Service. Uh, there's a pilot project was started in Dolphin House in Dublin for mediators, uh, which is it's running a couple of years. That's very successful. It deals with some of the cases. And again, uh, the, the mediators are on... Uh, on the premises of Dolphin House, and that yeah. that seems to have worked. It also, I think, is, has been rolled out in Ennis, in, in Clare as well. So th uh, that's the kind of thing that I suppose everybody would like to see in courthouses, that you have the mediation, you have the ADR yeah. uh, in relation to it. But just to say, in terms of the solicitors who work in the Legal Aid Board, uh, are completely overworked in terms of the volume of cases, and there's a constant um, uh, pressure on them uh, to service people. Uh, maybe uh, outsourcing it or more resources w would help, but the, the waiting lists are just too unacceptably long. Okay. Could uh, Deputy, be... Deputy, would you mind? Uh, yes. It's just that I've had an indication going back a little bit oh, in relation to one of your questions. Oh, yes, I'd sorry. like to invite Julie to come in, sorry, please. Yeah, so just to come in on the impact of delays on families, in particular on children, I hear from children directly who are sitting at home wondering what is going on, thinking, OK, something has happened in the family. We're going, trying to go into court. They think the parents go into court on the Friday. The parents do go into court on the Friday. They think it's all going to be resolved, and it isn't. They don't know what is happening. Families are going through turmoil because of the delay. I have parents calling me up who are taking a day off work to go in and then not realising that they're going to have to go in again. They think that they're going to go in and have it heard and have it sorted and they can move on with their lives. So the impact of the, the delay on families and in particular on children and on the relationships that they have with their parents, because sometimes what you can find is that children might not be able to see one parent during this period or they might have very limited contact or there might be arguments as to when there is contact. So the impact of the delays on children in particular in particular are very significant. But I think the issue overall is that the system that we've created is not done with families and children in mind. And it goes back to hearing the views of children. Yes, the Act, the 2015 Act, is silent on how the views of children are heard. But the system that we have created has not actually made provision that is a child-friendly place, that is a child-friendly proceedings that children can have actively have a, have a position, can be part of if they wish. Because I hear from children who may have been heard through an expert and who do not feel that their voices have been heard at all. And sometimes they want to talk to the judge themselves. So I think while there is no consistency, no. there is the looseness is there for a reason in some respects, because every child is different. Every family is different and every situation yeah. is different. And really, the system needs to catch up with that reality and needs uh, to be more friendly for families. I'm going to invite Saoirse, followed by Cleana, Deputy O'Callaghan. Your questions are of universal interest. So. <laughs> um, just on the practical, whether you could actually um, try and standardise how, how you hear the views of the child. Um, Dr O'Mahony talked about the, the GAL system there, and obviously there is going to be a national executive office set up in the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, and that's actually a really welcome development for public law proceedings. But we also feel that this could be a way to extend it to um, private law proceedings, and that over time that that should be looked at as a potential way to ensure that there's equality between children in family law proceedings and those who are going through childcare. And sometimes, you know, mm. there's a mix of both. Um, and, you know, certainly we've brought this to the Department of Justice. They are in talks with the Department of Children and Youth Affairs about how this could be potentially be done. Um, and I know it is kind of a longer term objective, but I think that is is a really practical way. We shouldn't be creating inequalities between different children depending on what um, type of court proceedings that they're coming across. Yeah. 
Yes, you should clean, please. I think in terms of practical terms, one of the things is that the impact is dissipated and a lot of these people, you know, they, they end up relying on services in the community and the welfare, the welfare and, that's, and we're not adding all that up. Um, the domestic violence uh, bodies and services are really looking at how homelessness um, and domestic violence are, are interlinked. Uh, but at the moment, in terms of homelessness, we're not really talking about domestic violence. We separate mm -hmm. and silo those. So I think there's a fair, fair amount of work to be done on just how this impacts in terms of poverty and in terms of homelessness. Okay. Yeah, I suppose, in, uh, sorry Chair, I'm going to finish soon. Uh, I, I suppose in terms of um, family law proceedings, like any time anyone goes to court in a non-criminal context, I suppose, like the, the best solution is for the parties to sort it out themselves, okay? And do you think we could put into our report any recommendation that would try to make parties and family law recognise that they're in a much better position if they can try through mediation to resolve their disputes to get agreement on access to children rather than the cut and thrust of a court case where generally you have a winner and a loser. Is there anything we could do to encourage that in our report? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 currently, uh, there, there are provisions uh, in the Mediation Act which have greatly strengthened the obligations on solicitors when the client comes in the door the first day. So a solicitor now has to swear a statutory declaration that they've uh, discussed mediation. That has been far more effective than the old system of certificates. So, so that is in place there. I think what we believe is uh, if, if you can resolve things outside the courts, that's the best way, and that's in our, certainly the family law guidance that we give to solicitors. But when it does get to court, what we believe is we need the active case management intervention of a judge immediately. Okay. Uh, currently, you go to the county registrar for case progression within the system. The county registrar doesn't have the same teeth, if you like, as a judge, and people only really see the judge at the end of the case. What we believe and what we're looking at now is maybe introducing the judge at the beginning to say, look, you're in court, but you could can still consider all this ADR and have the judge lead an examination of how far this case needs to go. So the judge does two things. Currently, the county registrar does a case progression or case management. But what we think maybe, and it certainly could be looked at, is that a judge would look at the case management, but also would say, well, look, you can do all this stuff. But have you thought about other ways? Now, that probably wouldn't be the judge who would ultimately yeah. hear the case. But you, if, I think if you got a judge in there quickly, that might help to resolve cases that currently take a lot longer, but could be done much quicker and you could front load it. But that involves a, a commitment of resources from the judiciary and also from the practitioners okay. and the parties involved. Okay. Our line wish to come in, please. Uh, to kind of... Come back to you on that, Deputy. I completely agree with Mr Walsh um, that, as a general rule, front-loading is the way to go, that early act of case management. Um, and certainly, I've been an advocate of that for years on the criminal side, children or no children, whether it's a family situation or not. Um, but I think um, the idea of mediation, uh, alternative dispute resolution, uh, the principle of it has got certain limitations and I think one should be very wary of advocating it or using it in any situation where there's an indication that there's sexual violence there or domestic violence or an abusive situation of some kind or yeah. another because there's a the huge potential there for the abusive party to manipulate That's the process um, completely to the de detriment of the other people involved, the other members yeah. of the family. So that would be my fear that uh, people might feel um, there is a risk if it's not done properly that in the early stages um, and a party who has been or has witnessed sexual or domestic violence in a domestic setting would be would feel they had no choice or yeah. that they would feel constrained or uh, that it was very hard to avoid mediation even though everything else would be screaming against it yeah. their instincts would be screaming against okay. it and with good cause so. yeah i think i agree with you entirely and i think yeah. in fairness in the mediation act it expressly excludes domestic violence act or domestic violence so yeah. just finally can i ask Kleena and caroline you mentioned on the in, in the area of transparency about how there could be sort of non-disclosure agreements. Like, is it the case that if in a family law proceedings it was disclosed uh, in aff on affidavit or in evidence that there was sexual abuse or an allegation of sexual abuse against a child was made, is it possible that that 
would be subject to some form of a non-disclosure agreement or that, that that would not go to the authorities? So we, this is, this is part of the, the data we are looking for and in terms of when we talk about transparency, we'd like a lot more data on this. this, this we don't have anything but anecdotes on this okay. um, because of the nature of, of family law and how it's conducted. Um, but we do have anecdotes on it, so that, that raises you know, this question of how many. Um, one of the, where this begins to intersect is with TUSLA and um, the Child and Family um, Agency. And, and we, we have to look at how TUSLA engages on this question. As I say, if there's 96 to 96% 96 failure rate for, for child sexual abuse that is disclosed, that we, we, can, we, can, you know, we are sure is probably true. Um, if some of these are ending up in family courts, how are they, how are they being handled? Um, TUSLA have a system whereby they categorise these, the, from these 3,000 referrals, they categorise these in terms of the risk management as founded and unfounded. The, they do not disclose, and they do, there's no public data on what percentage of these cases they deem to be founded and they deem to be unfounded. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what they send into the family courts and how they behave in relation to the family courts and what information they give into the family courts will, will depend on how they categorise these cases, whether they're founded and unfounded. And indeed, Tuslis, um policy around how it treats an unfounded case varies. You know, there isn't a standard way of, of, of handling this risk assessment. It's, uh, naturally, it, it, it will always need to be, to be individualised. These cases are, are highly... Um, th there needs to be an individual response to it. So in terms of can we end up with a situation where there is child sexual abuse in a, family, in, in a private family case, um, we would say yes. Um, mm -hmm. for, for all the reasons that, that we've mapped out here. And what, what is critical for us to know is, is, is can, can we begin to log this? Can we put a number on this? Can we count it? Okay. So, you know, for, we think there's an awful lot that is hidden. And we think an awful lot, you know, for example, as Caroline said, you know, on, on, the, on the ADR, we, don't, we do not know how many of these ADRs involve people who, ha who are in situations of coercive control and domestic violence who make a calculation that it is easier to compromise. And we don't know to what extent the cases that are long and protracted where people will not agree, in fact, are, are because there is domestic violence and sexual violence in the middle of them, we're not counting these allegations um, that are part, parts of these cases. Not, not to say that they're true, yeah. Just to say that they are part of the case. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chairman. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Deputy O'Callaghan. And uh, our next contributor is Deputy McWallace, please. Thanks, Gaherlock, and thanks very much for your contributions. Um, um, it's, um, I, think, I think I'm more confused now than I was at the start. Um, but I, I, I'm sure after um, our listening to you and listening to the other groups coming in, um, we'll have a lot of food for thought. But um, it looks like it's going to be very difficult uh, to make things uh, as good as we'd like them to be. And um, I think you're all agreeing that um, resources are going to be a big challenge uh, because it's going to cost a lot of money uh, to make it all fit for purpose. And um, so we're up against the wall then of whether those resources uh, will come on stream. Uh, just first, on, on the views of the children um, thing, right? Um, Obviously, he's made the point that no additional resources were allocated to pay for the experts required uh, to complete the advice of the child's report. Um, uh, and uh, the Law Society calls for cases to be resolved earlier in the process with a focus on the alternative dispute resolution. Uh, but as Caroline pointed out there, that, um, she raised concerns about the use of ADR in cases regarding child sexual violence and domestic violence. I wonder, how, does the Law Society think, uh, how do you feel about the use of ADR in these complex cases? Certainly we fully agree with the Rape Crisis Centre that it shouldn't be used where there is domestic violence or, or allegations of, of, of sexual violence. Or I, I mean, ADR is, is suitable for some areas, but we agree it is uh, totally unsuitable uh, for that. So we, we, we have a policy uh, against that. It, it may be worth dividing up family law in, into two or three areas. One is 
the circuit court, which deals primarily with legal separation and divorce, and the other is the district court, which deals with the public law, which is the childcare, taking children into, into care, and also access, custody and guardianship cases, which are primarily non-marital. So if you like, there's a division within our court system between the circuit court, which deals with people who are married and deals with all their problems in one go as a bundle, if you like, in divorce or in judicial separation, and people who are unmarried who have to go really to the district court, and that deals with guardianship and then separately with maintenance and then, then separately with custody uh, issues. Um, and then the, the public law child care, which is the taking children into care. There's a variety of other things, but they're the main headline ones. So if you like, when we talk about ADR, um, it's, it's primarily, it, there, we say there's no reason, if there's no allegations of uh, sexual uh, violence or, or, or other issues like that, that it couldn't be uh, trialled and divorce and judicial separation issues. And again, that's, they're primarily issues of money and children. They're the two, the two issues, really, that, that in judicial separation and divorce. So that can be done either before you go to court or after ideally as soon as possible. In the district court, which deals with custody access, guardianship, again, ADR is suitable in the majority of those cases and should be tried. And you may not solve everything by ADR, but you may get quite a number of the things netted down or, or, or issues resolved on it. Uh, you couldn't... ADR isn't necessarily suitable in the public law cases because it's a kind of a... Uh, it's a binary thing. Either the child is going to be taken into care or not, and there may be a voluntary element to it. So I think ADR is, is a case by case, but generally where possible, it, it certainly reduces the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the resources uh, required by the court system. But it does require alternative resources. You're not going to, to, to get this without putting another judge or two, but we see that within the system, if, if you resource this properly in the longer term, it would definitely pay pay back and most importantly it, it would reduce the costs, the legal costs involved for the parties and more importantly it would speed up the time, uh, uh, the time uh, required to, to resolve all the issues. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, Jim was talking about, uh, well uh, despite Article 42A, um, the voice of the child has still not really been heard, and uh, and I can just imagine. I mean, Jim was making the point that it's going to be very, very difficult anyway to actually um, to bring that about, and it's very hard. Uh, um, I've, um, I just think that um, it's, it's an awful big challenge altogether. Anyway, but on, under the 15 Act, the appointment of a child's views expert is entirely at the discretion of the court. There is no guidance in the Act as to, as to what should happen in cases in which the court decides not to appoint an expert, whether for financial reasons or the case in which the child is deemed able to speak for themselves. And given that the courts can be such an intimidating place, intimidating place for the kids, and many of the judges and lawyers are not trained or equipped to speak with children in that setting, uh, is there an agreement that the experts should be in the default position uh, in law rather than being discretionary? You're directing your question to Well, uh, just about anyone. I mean, uh, you, you're all pretty well versed in it all. all right. <laughs> Dr. O'Malley, please. I'm not sure I would go so far as to say a default position because uh, the point was made earlier on by Julie that every child is different. So ideally, you do want to have a menu of options. So if you're dealing with a 16-year-old, a 16-year-old may be very well able to speak for themselves and it may be a better vindication of that particular child's rights to have them directly participate uh, rather than doing it through the medium of an expert. Obviously then when you're dealing with much younger children that's when the communication barrier is more significant. So uh, my personal view would, would be that, that it's more important to have that flexible menu of options rather than uh, having one default position that you shoehorn every child into. Uh, but uh, as I've already mentioned I think for me the big gap is that because the 2015 Act of Present only <coughs> speaks about the expert, it doesn't speak about the other options at all, which then raises the question of, well, what are those options and how shall they work in cases where experts aren't appointed? And we know that there will be cases where experts, experts are not appointed. Thank you. Connor, Cleaner, please. Uh, yes. just, just very briefly, and to problematise this, we've, we've 
mentioned the expert a number of times, and, and but we need, to we need to look at that as well and unpack that slightly. Um, we, we need to look at what the criteria for specialisation, what is an expert, um, what, what sit, what, where do they sit, where are they accountable, what are their professional bodies, um, what qualifications do they need. We need to look at that whole area as well as how they're resourced. Um, for us, certainly, in terms of this expert, we would be looking for a specialisation that would be able to recognise things like coercive control and grooming, um, you know, the, in terms of any of these, any of these, any of these experts. You? Uh, um, on the issue of um, the, um, the the guardianship of infant sites, um, set the maximum fee for a child's view report at three twenty five, and obviously um, Keith made the point that in all cases this isn't going to cover it, but yes, uh, and for many families they, that's too high. Uh, I presume. Um, some sort of a mechanism has to be put in place. Is that what you're recommending, where the state is actually going to foot the bill? And if that's the case, how do you manage it and control the, the, the costs? Let's start with Sioux this time. I suppose we do think that the state should foot the bill because it would actually circumvent um, parents you know, deciding whether or not they can, they, they'll employ a child abuse expert. Some just won't be able to afford it. So, you know, we would see something like the legal aid scheme, you know, having something like this. And they did have a pilot project, but again, the fees were very, very low for child abuse experts. And I think we need to, you know, we talked to Bernardo's, um, we actually made, um, the regulations have just come out in December. They came into force on the 1st of January this year. So, you know, they've been a long time in the making. The, the Act was enacted in 2015. Um, and we did make submissions on this, as did the National Advisory Council on Children and Young People, around those fees, because we talked to people like Bernardo's who operate the Guardian at Leadham scheme and asked, how many hours would it take for you to actually carry out this kind of work? They said it was a about 30 hours because you have to establish a relationship of trust with the child, you have to um, go back and forth, you have to ensure that the child isn't being coached by one or both parents, um, you know, so, so this all takes a lot of time. So I think, you know, there is a responsibility on the state to actually provide resources to do this. You know, we've put it in legislation now um, to actually enforce that legislation, we need to ensure that um, that the, the regulations are fit for purpose. And just on the, the issue of um, the kind of people who can be appointed as experts, the regulation set out four different professions, but one of those isn't actually, um, you know, it comes under Carew, the health and social care professionals, that would be um, psychologists, but, you know, that hasn't all been regulated yet. Like, that's still in the process of being... Um, being regulated. So if you have a complaint about a person, who do you go to? Who do you make that complaint to? That isn't clear from the regulations. And some of our members would also have asked for those, um, for the professions that can be made a child abuse expert uh, to be fleshed out further, because the, you know we're, we're afraid that we will lose some really valuable expertise that, that could be done. But ultimately, the fees that are there are far too low. Um, and I don't think that that's going to solve the problem. I think we need to find a way. Again, the National Executive Office in DCYA, when it's established and up and running, I think could look at some of these issues and how that could be addressed. Thank you, Saoirse. All right, Deputy. Um, just the, um, in, in relation to the inappropriateness um, of the setting for uh, criminal issues, um, You've been pointing out that the, that the buildings don't suit. Um, so, are the is is there a facility or, or space in the um, existing courts to where you could refurbish and make good? Or are we looking at new buildings? Uh, or are we uh, looking at using different settings? Like, I was just wondering, for example, can something like a school be modified to, uh, and used part-time for it or something? I mean, there's a huge cost involved if you're looking at new buildings and you're looking at a number of them. I presume you've got uh, one per county again, I presume, like uh, with the other courts. Um, and the other point, uh, just in, probably in reply to what Sears said, just said to me there, um, about the funding and the court, uh, the state paying, footing the bill. I mean, um, as a matter of interest, do, do any of you groups ever sit down with the likes of the Department of Justice and talk about the fact that the legal aid system needs modification and more money? 
and that we can have all the legislation we like, but if we don't uh, enforce it and resource it, then uh, we might as well not in introduce it at all. Mm -hmm. So, but DEI actually sit down and, and explain to them, listen, this is not fit for purpose. What are you going to do about it? Okay, Keith, please. Yeah, yeah the Law Society, I think all the groups here sit down regularly with, with the Department of Justice and uh, with the Court Service uh, to, to set out all the issues that we've, we've ventilated here today. We also have a user group with the Legal Aid Board because obviously the Law Society uh, wants to support the solicitors and the Legal Aid Board who are overworked and, and, and underfunded as well. So we, we get it both, uh, both sides of it, if you like. Uh, in terms of the premises, um, there is a, prem a vacant lot currently on Church Street beside the uh, corner of the Four Courts, which has been earmarked about four or five years ago as the new system of family uh, courts, just, uh, the system of family justice, I think. Uh, and it, it, it was apparently green lighted and is now stalled somewhere uh, in the Department of Public Expenditure and uh, between those and justice. And we've been, the Law Society, and I'm sure the other groups here have been in, in constant touch with the Department about moving this project on. That, uh, if it was enacted in Dublin, would be kind of the flagship for this uh, integrated uh, system of specialist family justice with mediation with the Legal Aid Board, with uh, ADR providers. Uh, it would house the Children's Court, which is, if you like, where, where criminal issues regarding children uh, go. It would house the public law, the private law, the circuit court and the high court. So that, that would be a, an ideal way to, de to deal with it. And we certainly got very detailed into the formatting of it, the layout. Um, if, if, if this, I, we say that the specialist uh, system, uh, the, the specialist division of family uh, courts cannot wait and that we, we must make the best of what we have with the court service. So the, the, we're really going to have to identify the regional centres and see can it be rolled out, and we're talking to the court service about that. But we really can't wait, if you like, for the buildings to be built. We have to do our best with what we've got. The reality is that family law has always been the poor sister or the poor relation in relation to resources, but we really do need to see the specialist court set up as soon as we can. And it maybe it has to go a bit ahead of the premises, but if we're going to wait for the buildings to be built, we'll never have a specialist division of family courts. So I'm afraid we're going to have to do our best with what we have and maybe think creatively with the OPW and with the court service and with the Department of Justice and say, look, you may not have those facilities. But I mean, again, we want this to be pressed ahead and unfortunately it is never going to be uh, fully resourced and we're going to have to, the best may be the enemy of the good in relation to this. Thank you, Keith. And Saoirse, you wish to come um, in? I'd agree with everything that Keith just said about um, Hammond Lee and, and progressing up, but um, Deputy Wallace, you asked about alternative um, spaces for, for children and families to carry out some of, some of the, the family law issues. And just to kind of point out that there was a great uh, project that um, was in operation a couple of years ago that was run by Bernardo's and one family, both of which are members of the Children's Rights Alliance, and they were child contact centres. So the issue of access for um, families and children has been brought up already. Um, and those centres actually operated really effectively. They provided a kind of neutral space for children to meet with, with the other parent. Um, Families found them really useful, but funding was actually cut. I think they ran over a number of years and then funding wasn't reallocated to them. But that is something, and we've been talking to some of our members who are um, domestic violence services recently, and that, that's something that they would all advocate for, that we relook at that system. It was cost effective, it provided um, child friendly spaces uh, to, for, for children to actually access the, their other parent, and particularly as um, Keith had pointed out earlier, there are issues around um, particularly single fathers having adequate accommodation given the housing crisis um, to actually have the space to meet with their children and, and have those access visits. I think the necessity for new buildings varies from place to place. There are some court buildings in the country which are uh, in fairly good shape and which could have some slight modifications that could accommodate this sort of thing. There are many that would not. Certainly at district court level, there are a lot of 
uh, very small Victorian style district court buildings which are utterly unsuitable um, and there's been reference made to the, the Chancery Street Courthouse in Dublin which is almost the last place that something like child protection cases should be heard uh, you know with razor wire on the, the walls and bars on the windows of the consultation rooms and so on um, but it, could you use other types of buildings absolutely uh, and in some ways for these kinds of cases the less it looks like a traditional courthouse the better so uh, you wouldn't have to be building uh, shiny specialized court buildings in every town in Ireland uh, I mean there, there is a lot you could do creative by using other types of accommodation uh, and then through regional centres for the, 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 the more uh, dedicated buildings. Thank you for that. Caroline, were you showing there? Were you? Yes. Yeah. Please. That, yes. That's all right. Just to, first of all, to endorse what other people have said, <coughs> all the other speakers have just said about buildings and facilities. And just to make the point, I guess, um, I think it was you said it, Connor, that, and I completely agree with this too, that idea of a menu of options what is it for this individual child that will make it easier for them to participate in the process? That's where we should be starting with the children and having that menu of what will in the criminal courts be called special measures and in perhaps in the wider context, the criminal proceedings, uh, protective measures. That's, that's a great place to start. And that leads me on to training. It's that specialised training. It's that understanding of the range of different approaches which might be suitable for an individual child, for everybody, for court service staff, judges, um, lawyers who are appearing regularly in the system. Everybody has to have that sort of basic understanding then that acceptance that every individual child needs an individual approach and from there springs ideas Im imaginative solutions to the problem of uh, the fabric not being adequate um, you can get creative very easily and you can improvise for a period while you're waiting for this beautiful new courtroom to be built in your area um, just by thinking what is really essential here. It's essential that the place be friendly, that the place be safe, that the place be not intimidating, that the child has an, uh, an opportunity to ask questions about the procedure beforehand, and that the actual process in court is um, child-friendly, there are no, no bullying of the witnesses allowed, no repetitive questions in convoluted legal language are allowed, and so forth and so on. So it, it's, that's where to start, I think. Deputy Wallace, yeah, please. Yeah, um, I, you, some, I think it was Cleona uh, pointed out, you were talking about the, um, the in many cases, uh, cases of child sexual violence end up being dealt with in the family law settings rather than in the criminal justice system. And uh, we know that the um, conviction rates uh, are incredibly low um, for in cases of child sexual violence, and uh, I think it's something about 4% I read, um, but um, as well as the low rates at present, the courts are not gathering statistics on child sexual violence or domestic violence um, as part of the cases in civil family law courts. Um, I know you touched on it there earlier. I mean, but how would you actually uh, go about um, the data collection and publication? I mean, have you, have you thought this out? And uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, um, so the, the, the criminal justice, the prosecution rate that the Guard Inspectorate found was 4%, with a, with a conviction rate of 2%. Um, so that leaves everything else, um, and accepting that some of those will simply not be true, between 2% and 8%. Um, so, so not every one of those cases are going to end up in our family law system, but, some, but, but many of them will in some way, shape or form. And as Keith said at the very outset, um, you know, the family law system is broken. So there's something for us about how these, the sexual violence cases disappear into a broken system um, and how we, we lose sight of them. So in terms of then how... So that's why it's critical that we, we figure out how to count them and how to keep a track of them. Um, this would be a matter for the court services. Um, it would be... You know, you're looking at cases where, in terms of case management, in terms of what we're asking the, the, the servants of the court to do in terms of logging the types of cases that are going through the courts, um, 
you would be looking at logging you know, certain, certain things like, is there an allegation of sexual violence? You know, as simple as that. In this case, yes. Um, does it mean it's true or not? It, it makes no judgment on that. It simply says it's present. And then we would have an indication that it's, you know, what percentage of child sexual violence allegations are present in, in family law courts, public and private. Generally in public, it's, it's going to be straightforward, but in private um, is it, the critical area, of, uh, the blind spot. Um, one of the other areas we're, we're, um, we're looking at, and I put it, we put it as, as footnotes in our, in our um, submission there, is, is also just the, the, the question of, of and, and the practitioners will be, will be very familiar with this, how these cases, some of them are interminable. We're, we're more, more used to dealing with criminal law where we have a nice, neat, um, you know, we, there, there are cases that are sub judice and then there are case, cases that are finished and we can talk about them. Um, when we, when we venture into this space, these cases seem interminable, but the system doesn't track them as one case, so they, they pop up again and again and again, so the system doesn't know how long these people, the same people, remain in the system coming back over and over again. So we could, we could really fix that part as well, so that the system understands just how long and interminable some of these are, because you continue to be brought back in, if you like. And I think particularly this is likely where there is situations of coercive coercive control and domestic violence where the courts are essentially being 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 used um, in this way. So I think visibility, this type of visibility where the court services can can put, can really begin to track this data will give us a handle on this and will, be, will allow us to begin to have this conversation where we go, how do we manage this? What's the case management that we need around this? What are the practices and specialisations we need around this? I just two last questions. Uh, uh, come together? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Connor, uh, you said that we don't need a constitutional amendment for the establishment of a specialised family court. But uh, what legislative changes uh, would you envisage has been necessary? Um, I know the Law Society recommends establishes within the, establishing it within the circuit court system, whereas you suggest that family law divisions could be set up within the district, circuit and high courts in terms of practicality and costs, which I think is the most realistic. And my last question, just uh, uh, on the issue of fathers, um, who um, um, so many feel um, are um, probably not getting, um, <laughs> some, some feel anyway that they're not getting a fair deal. I went through the system myself, and uh, I'm just wondering, how do you address that? I mean, is, it a, is there a re-education process needed for the judges? We'll start with Connor, please, and then I'll come to maybe the Law Society then, one or other of you, and all hands afterwards. Please, Connor. So, so to, to legislate for a specialist family court, I mean, there are various approaches you could take. Uh, probably the, the, the cleanest and quickest way to deal with it would be that at present what you have are that different uh, aspects of family law are allocated to different courts. Keith alluded to this earlier on. So some decisions are made in the, in the district court, some in the circuit, some in the high court. Um, what could very easily be done uh, and what is done in other areas, and I mentioned earlier on the children court for criminal matters involving children, is that for those ha family uh, cases you designate those courts at, when they are hearing those issues as the district family court, the circuit family court uh, or the family high court and then the legislation would then set out well, what are the characteristics of the district family court that differentiate it from the regular district court, be that procedural, be that facilities, be that uh, specialist training for judges or other staff members and so on. And in that way you, you, you slot it into what we already have, but you then separate it out in terms of that level of specialisation around the staffing and the facilities that makes it a specialist court. Thank you for that. Uh, Keith or Helen? Helen, please. Um, in relation to the issue of fathers, um, there has been very little research done on how fathers are treated in the family law system. And certainly we would be calling for um, proper research to be done to ascertain exactly what the position is. You know, whether they, certainly anecdotally it seems to be that there's a perception that fathers don't get a fair crack of the whip. And um, so certainly we need more research, we need more data to see how in fact they are treated. And also, I suppose, following on from that, it comes back to what we're also advocating, that there is a need for specialist judges, judges to be trained. I suppose society has changed. The role that a father would have had, you know, 20, 30 years ago could be very different to uh, the role that a father has now. And we don't know whether that's being reflected in court orders in respect of maintenance, in respect of access in particular. Um, 
you know, so certainly we need some research on that. Thank you for that. Tina, did you indicate? Uh, yeah, just, just really to, to back up a lot of what you've just said there, what, what this comes down to is data, because right now we don't know what the situation is. Um, we have other pieces of data around, for example, the distribution of, of care um, in terms of, of the raising of children. So, you know, we have a 70% of the time it's mothers who are doing the caring there. So what is, you know, when you get into court in terms of these decisions, how does that impact? Um, we have, we have um, income you know, inequality between women and men as well, so that, that plays a part. But until we have data on what's happening in the courts, we can't even have the conversation. So really this is another area where court services could really begin to, to illuminate us, illuminate this for us, so that we can actually have a conversation based on evidence. Thank you for that panel and thank you Deputy thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Senator Francis Black, please. Mm -hmm. Gearlock, um, and thank you all so much for coming in today and for the great work that you're all doing. Um, I suppose my head is spinning a little bit here when I hear everything. When I hear your presentations, it's like it's a minefield. And, you know, I, I suppose I'm thinking, like, if we can't in Ireland, you know, make our children, our vulnerable children, a number one priority, then I don't know what kind of a country we are. It should be absolutely you know, a number one priority, and there's no doubt about it. And the image of, you know, of, of the bridewell and the family law and children going into that scenario, and it's so traumatic. I can't imagine what it must be like for them. And I suppose there's a couple of areas um, that I want to touch on, and Jim kind of touched on it there a little bit around uh, prevention um, and... Um, and how you see that, in the sense that, what, what I mean by that, I'll give you an example. I, you know, I work in family therapy myself, but specifically with addiction. And I also want to touch on addiction a little bit, because I'm sure it plays a huge role across the board when you're talking, you know, about, you know, family law and court cases and all of that. I mean, it does play a huge role in it. And, you know, and I'll just give an example um, of, you know, say a family that we might work with where you have one, uh, maybe one parent who's in addiction um, and the other parent is so preoccupied and stressed and worried and anxious and the chaos that it, you know, that it brings, you know, into the home that the children can often be left neglected. They can you know, the, the other parent who's not in addiction just can't function. Um, the children are then neglected and then as a result you have, you know, the older child taking care of the younger children and they're kind of looking after themselves. Um, and all of this chaos is going on and then there comes a court case and, you know, if there was some way of preventing all of that with regard to resources in maybe addiction services or maybe um, the services working together. I suppose that's really what I'm trying to, to look at. If TUSLA worked with the addiction services or, you know, to, to see is there some way of preventing it to get into that last stage of, um, of, of the court case where the children don't have to go through all of that. I just wanted to kind of get your opinion on that and what your thinking would be around all of that. Connor, we'll take you first. Just briefly to say, as a general matter, TUSLA as an organisation is under-resourced. Um, so if you focus on addiction specifically in your comments, there is a, a very distinct link between addiction and the child protection issues that come to the attention of TUSLA. Uh, TUSA social workers are so overburdened in trying to address the critical cases that this keeps them from doing the kind of work on early intervention that they might like to do, and that might catch things further upstream and avoid them becoming more acute, as you suggest. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think as a general matter, uh, when we talk about child protection, if we want early intervention to work, then we need to resource TUSA to be able to do that. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Yes, see you yeah. On prevention, early intervention, it is really important. And just to build on, on Connor's point, um, the area-based childhood uh, programmes have not been taken into TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency, and they specialise in prevention and early intervention. So that's going to actually start form, forming part of TUSLA's wider work, and I think that's really welcome. I think you're right that, you know, there needs to be a more joined-up approach to this. Um, and, you know, I think it, it needs to happen well before there is any crisis or any crisis stage. And I think you'll see from Carol Coulter's Child Law Reporting Project um, that parental addiction, parental alcohol abuse, does actually play a part in a lot of the cases that she's seen come before the 
uh, courts. So, you know, I think there's been a number of measures, like we would say, the Public Health Alcohol Bill, or Act, as it is now. Yeah. So used to calling it a bill that I forget it's an act. But, you know, th measures like that will hopefully help address some of those addiction issues. But I think with prevention early intervention, we have now an early years strategy, first five, and that is built in there as well. So we'll start seeing with the Affordable Child Care Scheme, we'll see provision for vulnerable families. Um, and there are a number of agencies that will actually be uh, tasked with identifying those families and actually providing them with quality full-time childcare to help with that family support piece, to help with that prevention early intervention, because if you can get children into a, serv a, like a good quality service like that, that has wraparound services, they can start identifying those problems earlier. Um, they can identify them to TUSLA and try and put in place the family support and parental support programmes that are needed to actually try and address that. So I think there is some work to be uh, happening and I think it's maybe something that we can send you further information on. Um, you know, we'll be launching our report card next week, mm. which will deal some, with some of those issues. Um, so I think, you know, you will see how we can join up some of the work that's existing and that might be useful for your own report. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Saoirse. Senator. Please. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's just a couple of other questions that I wanted to, um, I suppose, touch on. The legal aid piece, and um, um, Keith, you, you mentioned around how a lot of the um, legal aid um, lawyers are completely overburdened and overworked. And I suppose, how do you see, I mean, what, what would you recommend when it comes what is it that attracts, firstly, because I don't understand how it all works, so what attracts somebody um, to do the legal aid work and how can their lives be made easier or do they need more resources or what is it that's really uh, the, the major problem? Uh, I, I think the major problem is the volume of people who, uh, who need to go to legal aid because they, they fall within the means. Uh, it's, it's means assessed, so you have to be earning be below a certain amount of money to qualify for legal aid. So the amount of people who fall into that bracket who are involved in family law proceedings is, is, is quite large. And the Legal Aid Board, I think, are in roughly about a third of all the circuit court cases and a, a bit less of the, the district court cases. So the Legal Aid Board is a huge a player in terms of this. Uh, the type of person who, who's attracted, uh, certainly in my own experience, to uh, the Legal Aid Board would be uh, somebody who wants to make a difference, uh, who isn't necessarily motivated by, uh, uh, by money because it's not hugely well paid, and uh, who wants to genuinely go and try and help, uh, help people um, resolve problems. Um, resourcing is a huge issue. So if resources were given, some more resources to the Legal Aid Board, uh, so they could maybe hire more solicitors, but also to set up private practitioner um, uh, schemes that work and would take the burden off them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not talking about hugely well-paid schemes, we're talking about adequately funded schemes. So that would mean that, for example, instead of a Legal Aid Board solicitor spending a full day in a district court doing one case, uh, that th this would be hived off to private practitioners. And I think certainly a, a restructuring of uh, how the Legal Aid Board uh, do business is, is required, and they constantly look at that. But the one thing they say, and, and we meet with, with John McDay, the Chief Executive, regularly and with other members in, in their board, is that they do require some more resources due to the, the volume of, of people coming uh, applying for legal aid. And the difficulty, just to say, the delay uh, for the person on legal aid usually applies to the other person. They may also be on legal aid, and there's a delay in their case. But if they're not on legal aid, the court has this um, equality of arms and fairness that they have to look to. So if one of two parties is on legal aid, that slows the case down for both people, obviously. So if, if somebody applies for legal aid, that will that will slow it down. So I, we, we, I think the, the law side you really say more resources. Yes. And I suppose one of the other um, consequences of the overwork of the Legal Aid Board is that a lot of people represent themselves in court. Yeah. And they're quite entitled to do that. But very often it may be not by choice, but because they cannot wait. And there is a question there in terms of access to justice um, and also in terms of delays then, and in terms of training for judges dealing with, with, with personal litigants, you know, that, that raises a whole set of, of, of questions as well. 
you indicate, Connor? Yes, please. Uh, just, just to add to that, that, the issues with the Legal Aid Board, it should be said, are, are probably disproportionately on the custody access side of things. The child protection cases where the state is seeking to take a child into care, the Legal Aid Board prioritises those cases because of their nature. You know, if the state comes in with its legal representatives and is seeking an application for a care order, the judge will not want to proceed unless there is a solicitor for the parent. And because these cases often involve neglect or abuse, those applications can't wait. So the Legal Aid Board resources tend to be very much sucked up by trying to ha make sure that people in care order application cases have representation and then the private cases end up having to wait. But the impact on the private cases, as has already been mentioned, is that you may have a parent who is not seeing their child either. Thank you. Connor. Senator, you almost yeah. there? Yes, almost there. Good. I suppose there was just one thing that, um, well, there was one thing you said, Keith, around the family law uh, courts being the poor relation. Is that, is that how you describe Is that how you see it? Um, well, you know, I, yeah, sorry. I, I, certainly, you, you feel it when you're in practice in this area compared yeah. to other areas. It's not a very sexy area of practice, or mm -hmm. it's not treated particularly well in the hierarchy of the courts from, mm -hmm. from our perspective. that We, we view it as something that it, 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 it's had, it had traditionally has had difficulty getting funding allocated to it. Um, it, it requires a lot of funding, but it, it doesn't necessarily get it. So mm. there is a, a perception. And again, one of the difficulties, I think, is with the in-camera rule, that if people realised what was going on behind closed doors, they, they would, and the delays and all of that, but the in-camera rule effectively prevents things being reported on a daily basis about mm. the courts. All the other courts, if something happens in the courts, it's, it's reported. It, there's very, very little reporting of the family law uh, courts. Now, there is the uh, 2004 Act, which allows for, for certain journalists to go in and report on the courts. But the reality is, because of the, the issues in, in, in the media, uh, in terms of resources, uh, that it isn't necessarily something that, that the media want to devote, devote resources to people going in and sitting in the back of courts. So I think certainly we need some sort of change to the in-camera rule to allow people to see into courts not to reveal the identities of anyone, but just to say, look, this is how people are treated, whether it's fathers or mothers or children, in relation to guardianship, access and custody in the district court, and also in relation to, to separation and divorce, and then in the high court in relation to child abduction cases. Most people aren't even aware they, they happen or, or other mm -hmm. cases. So certainly, I think transparency would assist the whole system in terms of relaxation, further relaxation. But the, the, this is a hugely divisive issue between the people who are going to court don't necessarily want uh, anything by the time they get there. So this, this is a really tricky one for the, the users or the litigants in person and for the lawyers. I don't, this is an area that I don't think any two people would agree on. But certainly more transparency is essential. Otherwise, we will remain the poor relation. And we have to acknowledge that that's one of the reasons maybe for it. I just say before going back to the senator, just going over all that we've been addressing here this morning, that camera or light uh, has most definitely been brought into all of this by this exercise this morning. So Absolutely. well done. Just Senator. one final question around um, the mention of children um, in to the, going to the courts who feel unheard, and that's probably one of the worst traumas, you know, obviously that can happen to a child going into the court um, and not being heard. So do you recommend, um, and I, I, maybe you said this, and forgive me if I missed it, um, that there should be maybe a therapist or somebody there to support them, particularly if a child has been in any way sexually, sexual violence. Um, should there be a therapist with that child or should that happen all of the time? I'm just wondering what your thinking is around all of that. Who would you like? Julie, please. Yeah, so if I can come in, I suppose I, I raised the issue of children saying to me on the phone that they feel they haven't been heard. And this can happen in a variety of circumstances. It could be that they've wanted to talk to the judge and the judge has not wanted to talk to them or not heard their voice directly. Or they feel that what they have said has been misrepresented in some way. And I think what, what is needed is that ju judges and people working in the courts are more aware of what child-friendly justice is and how they can listen and hear the views of children and communicate back to them. So Saoirse raised the, the example of one of the judges doing an emoji judgment, explaining to the child what, that, yes, I heard what you said, these are the reasons why I haven't agreed with you, and this is what's going to happen. And often I find when I'm talking to children, young people across the board in any area, that if you explain to them 
that you've heard them and why you've come to a particular decision, they're more likely to accept it. And it's more likely to be easier for parents. Because also on the other side of it, I get calls from mothers and fathers who are saying, I've got a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old who is screaming and does not want to get into the car to go to access. And I think if, if an effort is made by judges in particular in the first instance to explain to children, to let them know why they've come to a particular decision and what the reasons were in a way that won't damage them, that won't traumatise them further, that is child friendly, that could have a really big impact. And then, uh, you're right, support services are key. And one of the big issues that I find on the information line that I run is that people aren't aware of what's there in the community. So actually, there is an awful lot of supports in the community for children and young people. Some of them have longer waiting lists than others and can be difficult to access, and that's another, that's another issue. But people actually aren't aware. They don't know that they can contact different people and get different supports. So I think it's an information piece that is also needed in that respect, linking people in, in, in the right places at the right time. Thank you, Julie. Senator, are you happy with that? Uh, did you want to say something Sorry, there, Kim? I beg your pardon, no. Just, just only to endorse, Senator, what uh, you've just been saying, Julie. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Information about what services are available is a very important thing for everybody who's involved in the justice system to have, if not in their heads, at least readily available <coughs> to them. And to have an eye also to um, a, giving, if you, as far as possible, making an effort to make sure that what you're talking about is actually appropriate for the situation as far as possible. Um, so, I mean, in the criminal justice system, uh, the Victims of Crime Act talks a lot about, um, or talks in a couple of places about um, specialist support services. So it's about information about the appropriate kind of service, at least if not a single service, but the kind of service that might be appropriate. That's it's very important that people like... Um, those who work in the court service and lawyers who are regularly dealing with family law have an idea at least where to go to find out the information or who to go to for a decent referral for a particular therapist. About therapists in court in the day, I'm not sure. I think it's much more important that all the professionals have that understanding um, that every child is an individual and may need, individ may need individually tailored supports in order to have their voice heard and to have that menu available of options is the thing that's the okay, thing that's key. Kleena, please. the only thing i would add to that is that no more than than Tusla being underfunded yes the the services are out in the community we're all desperately underfunded our waiting lists are enormous um, there are almost no services for teenagers in this circumstance um, the you know the so so that has to be looked at if you're looking at a joined up from the from you know, the whole way through the care system for the child, for it to be a child-centred response, then you need to look at funding the resources in the community also. I think we'd have taken that as... I just got to put it on the record occasionally. <laughs> well, I knew you couldn't possibly go back if it wasn't said. <laughs> well done. Can I just say, finally, um, I may have to leave a little bit early, so it doesn't, apologies that I, I, I might have to leave. There might be a vote in the, in the Shannon, so I just wanted to apologise before. It's okay, Senator, thank you. Now, Deputy Donica O'Leary, Deputy Jack Chambers, Deputy Peter Fitzpatrick is the order in which I saw each of the remaining colleagues. Just in terms of the time moving on, if... Remaining contributors, and I'm sorry this has uh, taken its time, but it's, it's so important, it's appropriate that we're taking our time with it. But if we could avoid any repetition, that would be the only help I'd ask. Deputy O'Leary, please. I'll do my best to avoid repetition. Good man. Gormina Magu Clare, Asfa and Show. Thank you very much for all being uh, here. It's been, I think Jim put it very well, like I suppose that all the issues in relation to this, I suppose. There mightn't be front and centre of the news very often, but obviously huge implications to people's right to relationships, people's right to safety, uh, really fundamental rights, and it's important that we get it right. Um, and I suppose, as I say, maybe some of the difficulty of the in-camera rule is that maybe it happens away from the public eye, but it's still very fundamental rights. Um, I suppose I might as well say as well, good to see UCC is very well represented here uh, this morning. Um, <laughs> the, uh, j just before I begin, one fairly straightforward question, I suppose maybe just forgive my ignorance, but a lot of reference to experts. Am I right in assuming that in the vast majority of cases the expert being referred to is a child psychologist? Is that more or less correct? Are there other examples of disciplines that would be involved? 
Well, the regulation we discussed sets out a number of categories of expert, one of whom is a child psychologist. Um, I think family therapist is not included in that definition. A teacher is included as well. No, oh, yeah. Teacher, psychiatrist, psychologist, social yeah. care worker and social worker. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I suppose just another question again. I suppose I've obviously never been present at uh, either private or public uh, family law cases. And I suppose one of the questions that I would have is, like, are there instances in which, I suppose I'm not entirely sure that I understand the interplay of the guardian ad litem and legal representation. And I suppose particularly in the context of a public case, like, are there instances in which a child might have, from a TUSA point of view, a child protection social worker and a guardian ad litem and legal representation? Like, how well does that work? Like, I mean, does that work generally seamlessly? Am I misunderstanding the process? Or... Uh, is it possibly sometimes a difficult situation for a child to be in a situation where they're dealing with three professionals, each whom has a slightly different, well, a different responsibility uh, and maybe a different perspective or philosophy, or does it actually in fact work perfectly seamlessly? Well, we'll take the court thing first. Connor. Off you go. <laughs> yes, I'd echo Deputy, Deputy O'Leary's comments in respect of uh, the, the, the strong UCC representation. Um, uh, to answer your question, the Child Care Act uh, is, is fairly specific on this, that the appointment of a guardian ad litem or a solicitor for the child is either or. Uh, so a child would not have both in a single case. Uh, and the evidence is that the mechanism in the Child Care Act whereby a solicitor can be appointed for a child is used very, very infrequently. In fact, in recent years, it appears there was only one judge in the country who was inclined to make use of that particular mechanism. So the guardian ad litem was really the, the primary vehicle in that set of proceedings through which the views of the child would be communicated to the court. There would always be a social worker um, involved on the TUSLA side, and then there would be a solicitor representing TUSLA in the proceedings, but a social worker would invariably be involved in presenting the evidence to the court uh, on behalf of TUSLA as to why the child should be taken into care or why there should be a supervision order. But it's important to say that the social worker is not impartial. So while the social worker may characterise themselves as uh, being in the court in order to represent the child's best interests and, in order to, uh, and they may have spoken to the child and may communicate that to the court, but the social worker is in court seeking a particular outcome. So it's almost equivalent to asking the mother or father in a private case what are the views of the child? And so that's where the guardian ad litem becomes so important because they provide that independent uh, analysis uh, sort of both on the child's best interest but also communicating the views of the child. So the social worker has a, a stake in the outcome, as it were, whereas the guardian ad litem is, is independent. Yes, you sure you want to add to Just that? Just to add to that, um, I think with the new child care amendment um, bill, that's, uh, and we should see a new version of that soon, there is provision that um, a child will be able to have both a gal and a solicitor um, if they're party to the proceedings, and that, that's, that's welcome. Um, as Connor said, you know, Section 25, a child being uh, joined proceedings, hasn't that, that hasn't really happened, and that is something that we would call for. We think that, you know, if you really want to ensure that a child is participating in proceedings, you have to assess whether or not they should be part of the proceedings, and there has been a paternalistic um, type of uh, kind of view of this, that, that, you know, that you should protect a child by not letting them be party, but, but they should be involved. They, like, ultimately, the decision is about them. So I think that's something that really has to be addressed. Um, so there is, the GAL bill will be coming, that, that, that's one um, area where I think that you could look at this again. Um, but I do think that um, with child views experts, that, that they, they, they really need to they really need to have the space and time to, to, um, to actually represent the actual view of the child. The UN Convention, the rights of the child, um, th there is guidance on um, Article 12, which is around the views of the child, and the representative is there to actually say what the child thinks, not to kind of interpret what the child thinks. You know, a gal will talk about the best interests of the child, but they're meant to actually say what the child's actual view is and not, you know, try and sugarcoat that for the court as well. Oh. Yep. Just in relation to the lack of clarity there, uh, in relation to Dr. Armani, and I suppose if anyone else wants to come in on this, uh, in relation to implementing Article 42A, if I'm understanding you correctly, like, I suppose there's three difficulties. One is where an expert isn't appointed, there's not a lot of clarity as to what should happen. Uh, there's not a lot of clarity in relation to 
how, I suppose, the, whether the child is capable, uh, I suppose, has the capacity to have their voice heard, and thirdly, where the um, where uh, an expert is to be appointed, uh, and it can't be, I suppose, but the parties can't pay for it. Like those are the three primary difficulties. Like is, like does the resolution of or would greater clarity in relation to that first matter, in relation to well, what happens if there's not an expert appointed? Like, is that the most crucial element? Like, I mean, obviously they all have to be addressed, but like, is that the most important element? Like, I mean, would that, I suppose, provide greater consistency uh, across the board? And I suppose, secondly, like, I mean, just in relation to the Child Care Amendment Act or the Child Care Amendment Bill you referenced, referenced to previously, does that, so far as you're aware, address any of the issues that you've identified in relation to clarity? It, it does on that last point because what it does is it requires the court, if it's in, in that instance, if it's not to appoint a guardian ad litem, which would be the public law equivalent of the expert in the private law cases, uh, you know, yeah. the, the, the person acting on behalf of the child to, to represent their views. Um, so the, the 2018 bill s states in Head 7.4 that if the court is not going to take the option of appointing a guardian ad litem, it must first of all explain why in open court and secondly must stipulate what it's doing instead. Um, and that, I think, is, is really crucial because if the court is obliged to state in open court, well, how are we going to ascertain the views of the child, then it becomes quite difficult for the court to simply not do it. Whereas the 2015 Act does leave the door open for it just to fall by the wayside, uh, that if the expert can't be paid for uh, and there's nothing in the Act about, well, what happens next, then it could simply not happen. Um, whereas if the court has to explain those reasons in open court, then it becomes much more difficult for a court to, to let it slip in, in the manner I'm describing. Um, so that I think is very important, but I also think the question of how does the court assess whether the child is capable, capable of forming the views is extremely important because that is the gateway to the obligation to hear the child kicking in. So all children who are capable of forming views must be heard. Children who are not capable of forming views uh, do not have to be heard. But how do we distinguish between those two groups and who distinguishes between those two groups? Um, and, you know, so one judge might take the view, I will bring in the expert simply to make that assessment in the first place. Another judge might attempt to make that assessment him or herself uh, and may or may not have the skills necessary to make that assessment properly. Uh, another judge might simply have a number in their head. I will speak to every child over a certain age and not speak to children below uh, that age. Uh, and so that's a recipe for inconsistency. So I think it would be good to have some clarity as to what that assessment, you know, we, we have this crucial gateway concept of children who are capable of forming their own views, but no clarity as to how we establish which children meet that criterion and which don't. Okay. It's, it's just to say, in practice, it is exactly what I'm It is falling by the wayside. The, the voice of the child and it because of the, the pressure on district court judges and on court listings cases are, are, are it is difficult for, for them to be dealt with but certainly take it up what Connor said I think there is a real way it could be dealt with if you mirror in private law proceedings uh, what's happening in, in public law ones as Connor suggested that the court should state how it proposes to facilitate or hear the voice of the child in, in court at the beginning and also if it also states if it is going to appoint an expert, if it is not going to state, appoint an export, expert uh, to hear the child's views, why, why not? And that, again, legislative change to the 2015 Act or the, the 1964 Act, that's all that's required to, to, to make this and then judges obviously have to follow the law. So this is, this is not a hugely difficult thing to do in terms of uh, a recommendation in a report from this committee uh, to change it. So that, that could be done and that would result in, in um, a, a kind of situation where rights are, are kind of slipping to, by the wayside. Uh, to put them front and centre. The difficulty, and I think the opposition you might encounter from the government in relation to that is, there's no doubt that would impose real resource obligations on district court judges in those circumstances which the government may not wish to resource. But that, I think, without that type of provision in the 2015 Act, it is only really paying lip service to the voice of the child. Thank you. Julie, you wish yeah, to... Yeah, I just wish to echo what Connor and Keith have said, but also just to build upon that, what could be introduced would be something like guidelines for judges on how they can actually carry out this function, and the judges and all other professionals, including lawyers, will be trained in how to communicate with children, how to work with children. And I mean, it's not something we haven't been doing already in our court system. It's worth pointing out that the Children's Court talks to children 
every day, all day, listens to children, children going to give evidence, it's a specially designed system. So I think we could learn a lot from how the professionals and the judges in that system engage with children. It's not this alien concept that we've never talked to a child before in our legal system and that we need to kind of really, you know, work on something brand new. We need to look at what we already have in place and what's in place in other jurisdictions, which Dr Manny said out earlier as well. There's a lot out there and I think it's actually can be done quite easily with the legislative amendment and then some other supporting pieces of work such as training and guidance. Thanks, Julie and Cleana, please. Yeah, and if we just think in terms of the of, of child sexual violence, um, you know, we we talked about if you like this this series of points where, where we're falling where there are, there are cracks through which you know these cases can fall. So we've talked about that, you know, falling through the criminal justice, the failures of the criminal justice system here. Then you have Tusla and Hikwa in the summer made some really urgent um, recommendations around specialisation there. So the people who are doing the assessments and, and talking to these children, um, you know, Hick, Hick was very clear that the specialisation really wasn't there um, and they needed to work on that urgently. They were training in specialist interviewers, um, right, I think some of the latest tranche was coming out in, in January, they were going to be trained in this. But if, if Tusla don't catch that, then you're not going to have these cases turning up in public um, family law. So the, the place they're then going to fall into for the next net, if you like, is the, the private family law and then you're facing a situation where you're looking at privately funding um, an expert where, where we haven't quite got the regulation right yet in terms of specialisation. Um, and provision, and you're looking at two to four thousand euros. So if you don't have that two to four thousand euros, where does where's the next? You know, there isn't another safety net that we can see. That is the last safety net, net and that's the last. You know, that's that opportunity where that child again falls through another crack. Thank you, Cleana. Deputy. Just to move on to another issue, I suppose I actually, I don't, like if people want to respond, they can. But I just want to put this, I suppose, just my own observations on it. The issue of access and that kind of stuff has come up. Like I actually, and Saoirse, you picked up on it. I've raised this point previously in relation to, to contact centres. I was actually, for a time, I was on the board of management of a family centre in Toker and Cork that had uh, a contact facility. It was top class, I have to say. Really excellent. Um, but one of the issues, and Dr. Er just as Conor Leary raised this uh, locally anyway, one of the issues that seemed to present is at one stage they were in a position to facilitate uh, contact from uh, Tusla referrals and uh, referrals from, from just as Conor Leary in this instance, but generally from family law cases. At the minute, so far as I know, the only contact that they provide is where there's a child protection issue and where there's and that reduces the scope and the options available to any uh, family law judges and I have to say really excellent facilities huge potential for them and I'd very much advocate uh, greater investment in them and support that just one of the other issues though in relation to access and I suppose maintaining relationships um, an awful lot of local authorities so far as I can see don't really properly take into account where uh, an applicant to the housing list has access rights, very often they're treated as a single applicant. I think that's an issue that needs to be uh, addressed as well. I come across that very frequently. Uh, just and I, If people want to come back on that, they can, but my, I suppose my other question is frequently come across the issue of, uh, I think it was yourself, Keith, that touched on it briefly in relation to maintenance. Like I mean, that's a huge issue for an awful lot of parents, uh, generally, I suppose, in the overwhelming amount of cases, uh, mothers, um, but, you know, difficulty in in getting what they what they're entitled to in terms of maintenance, very often I suppose they don't necessarily want to go down the formal route, but still very difficult uh, in terms of accessing maintenance in Britain. And I'm not necessarily that familiar with how the mechanisms will work, but I believe there is a child maintenance service. Uh, I don't know if any of the witnesses are familiar with it, and whether they have any views as to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's something that we should consider here. All right. Who would like to lead off? Sir Shoup, please. Um, some of our members would have brought this to our attention. One family, for example, would have advocated and continue to advocate for a child maintenance um, agency like the one in Britain because there are difficulties in what they find in actually getting the maintenance. But I think what they find is that it can sometimes the issue of money can exacerbate an already tense situation, and the fallout, you know, usually lands on the children. Um, and you know. Uh, access visits and, and those being maybe withheld. So I think there is something in looking at that. I know um, certainly in terms of maintenance with, um, sometimes that's used in terms of social welfare access to social welfare payments as well and there were some measures in, in Budget 2019 that addressed that so hopefully we'll start to see 
you know, a streamlining of that, but I think an agency that could be put in place to actually address the real issues in family law cases would be something that should be explored. Thank you. Yes, Keith. Just to agree with, with, the, with the agency concept, but also maybe a, a, a simplification of the maintenance to some degree or a bit more transparency so people would have a better idea of what they're entitled to. And again, ma maintenance is, is something that helps uh, people out of poverty, particularly if, if you're trying to cope on your own with with children. I, I mean, we should have a, a more streamlined system for maintenance. It's really a kind of a means test exercise to a great degree involving children. So there, there must be a, a more efficient way than the way we're currently dealing with it. So certainly there would be an argument for maintenance to be dealt with in, in a more streamlined way and, and any reform of the court structure uh, should look at that. As well as the enforcement of payment, we should look at how do we get there and can we do this any quicker uh, than the way we're doing it. Back to you, Deputy. Yeah, so there's, uh, two more issues generally, I suppose. We take them together? Uh, I'd rather not now because they're, they're slightly <laughs> different now. Um, I suppose, look, the first is an observation, really, to be honest. Look, uh, just in relation to the evidence from the Rape Crisis Centre, like, I, mean, I would have been aware generally of the low rate of charge and conviction for sexual crimes, but I had no idea that it was as low as that uh, in relation to in, into, uh, sexual violence against children. I, I, just shocked at that low level, and I suppose just echo your own call for for greater research and information in relation to it, because that is appallingly low. Um, I suppose uh, a final point there, like I mean, I, I, I'm interested. The point there, sorry, two final points. The 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 point there in relation to facilities, and like it seems to me that there may be potentially a need for capital investment, uh, significant capital investment to bring our, I suppose our courts of state up to scratch. So, like, I mean, not necessarily here on the floor, but if anyone is aware of whether there's a detailed document outlining the level of capital expenditure that would be required, um, I'm sure that would be usefully provided to the to the committee. But I'm also interested in the points made by Dr. Manny and a few others, I think, in relation to that there is maybe scope for more flexible approaches in terms of other buildings. I think that's, that's very interesting. Final question I'd ask, I suppose, is... Uh, we may consider this at a later date, but I think it would be remiss not to, I suppose, pose the question. Uh, the Minister for Justice is bringing forward a referendum, obviously, in relation to divorce, removing it from uh, the Constitution, and the proposition is also, uh, we haven't seen the detail of it, but that the indication is that there would be legislation accompanying that, providing for uh, reducing the period from, I think, four in every five years within the Constitution to separation in two out of three years in legislation. Just even just a brief initial view as to the legislative end of that uh, and whether that's the right approach, whether it's too restrictive, whether it's not restrictive enough and so on. Helen, I think you're first to indicate. In relation to the divorce referendum, um, my personal view is that the current system is leading to delays. We have a two or two year system at the moment where you can apply for judicial separation and then you apply for divorce. Now, that, that's doing the same thing twice, so there are delays and there's also cost. So I would certainly welcome the, um, the referendum, and I think it will uh, bring about huge improvements in family law if it is remitted to legislation so that you know, it is reduced to one year, two years. Um, I think it will be hugely beneficial. Thank you. All right. We're happy with that, Deputy, Deputy Jack Chambers, think, please. Doctor, Sorry, I beg your pardon. I think Cleana is indicating. Sorry, Cleana, I hadn't spotted you on I'll my... Keep, I will, I'll keep it brief, just in terms right. of the, 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 the rate of conviction. By and large, this committee is, is, is used to Rape Crisis Network Ireland being here on criminal matters. We don't ne necessarily come in here very often. On civil matters, we're here because of that failure rate within criminal matters. But, and that part is, is, is very important that we get that right. But we're also very conscious that there's a whole set of other things that happen before it ever gets into the civil, the civil law matters and that's why we're advocating around the, the national strategy on child sexual violence because while you can fix this part all of the others across the whole of government and across the whole of the system also need to be paid attention to. Thank you, thank you Deputy Leary. Deputy Jack Chambers. Uh, thanks Chair and uh, thank all the guests very comprehensive submissions and, uh, and obviously detail in terms of the questions. I just have a couple of uh, things I don't think have been maybe discussed up to now. Um, there's mention about, obviously, creation of a specialist court structure. Um, 
and has mentioned that it's no constitutional requirement. Could it be reformed by the President of the District Court anyway, without necessarily having to engage with the Oireachtas? Could it be through with government around funding in the court service? Do we need to have it mandated or structured by the Oireachtas? And can they recalibrate the... Like, what I'd like to know is how many more judges would we require? You know, would existing District Court judges be put into, siloed into a specific... Uh, family uh, law structure, like how many more would we, do you reckon we'd need? Just the practical um, requirements for structuring is kind of a separate place and, and would it be a regional system or would it be based on mirroring the existing uh, district court model that we have? Um, that's just one of my questions. I'm going to try and bank them together, Chair. Um, in terms of the regulations that were introduced and how they've made uh, the capping of the fees have made things worse. Worse. How can that be uh, be changed? So, is it 200? Just so I can understand, is it 250 euro? That's is that for the whole? What, just what's the fee structure? Is that because they're the? If maybe if you provide more detail on that, um, is it capped at 250 euro per specialist, or is it? for each, say, general consultation? So would it be a multi multiple of people? It, it's Maybe just answer that question. Yeah. So the, there's two rates in there, and they're for diff <coughs> slightly different purposes. They're different reports, but um, one is 250 and one is 325, I think. Um, and it's, it's, that's the one, to, like, that's the payment. So you're per, asking... Per, per, per specialist? Per expert. You know, you're asking... Because it, I think yeah. within the legislation, sorry for interrupting, but within the legislation, you know, when we're looking at it, and we've spoken to members about what it would actually take, and it takes about 30 hours, but this is, in the legislation, it's nearly seen as a once-off. You know, you meet with the child once, get their views, and, you know, go in, and that, that, that isn't actually how it would happen in practice. And do public professionals, um, do, they, do they, if they're publicly mandated, say, under with TUSLA or with a relevant state agency, if they're under the care of the child, are they being paid separately... Uh, for specialist reports in the court system, or is that something a private payment they receive? Um, in terms of GALS, guardians. Well, no, wouldn't we? No, I mean, say a social worker or. Yeah. Coming back and the number of yeah. judges, etc. The first yeah, question, well, yeah. Yeah. please. Um, I ju just in in relation to the um, the people who do this are 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 private, if you like. They do it uh, in their private capacity, so they're not funded. Um, if, if you qualify for legal aid, the legal aid board will pay for the assessor in your case. Mm. Uh, so that's slightly different. The difficulty with the regulation is it caps the, the total amount payable on a particular Section 32 type report, which means if you charge more than that, you are in breach of the law. And that is the real difficulty that you could be breaking. You could be doing something unlawful, or you will be doing something unlawful if you charge for a Section 32 type report specified in the regulations. And that, that, that has a fairly chilling effect on experts. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to the court structure, the difficulty at the minute in the courts uh, is that the, the president of the district court uh, has no great coercive power over other judges. And if, if you were going to get into that, I think it, you'd probably be straying into constitutional uh, territory as well. But my understanding is the Department of Justice have looked at this and it's a quite an advanced stage in terms of there may be potentially a draft bill in relation to uh, specialist courts. So certainly I'm sure this committee could, uh, could liaise with the department in terms of where, where they're at with this. But uh, what the Law Society would see it as is maybe between 10 and 14 uh, hubs, if you like, where you would have a circuit court and a district court mm. uh, sitting. Um, uh, it, it, we're looking, I suppose, at a family law division, uh, which would be that you would have a president of the family law division or a judge who would be assigned as the... Um, I, I, the, the, the title would probably not have to be president, but something else who, who would be in charge of the of the division in the circuit court and in the district court. And would you have 14 new judges in those positions? You, you may not. I mean, what, what we, one of the things that this, the, the, the Law Society had a number of um, uh, conferences and seminars around this about five or six years ago and four years ago where we discussed the, the advisability of limiting judges only to family law. And there was a concern by practitioners that if judges remain in family law, law 
uh, for the entirety of their careers and they're not switched around, it isn't a generally a good thing uh, that it, it is advisable that you, you get a bit of mix of practice. So you come into family law for a number of years and you may do it. So we want a general judge. At the minute, there's a number of judges who are created as specialist judges in the circuit court for insolvency um, ar arrangements and in relation to the Capacity uh, Act, which only recently came in. Those judges, some of them aren't sitting at all because they're specialist judges and they're in the circuit court and they, th there's, there's no cases for them. And because you're appointed as a specialist judge, you cannot do other general work. So those judges could be released immediately mm. uh, if they could be changed well, from specialists. So we, yeah. we're not generally in favour of the appointment of specialist judges. We are in favour of judges being properly trained and yeah. getting specialist experience. But, mm. I mean, you want a wide breadth of talent to restrict... Um, specialist family law judges to just family lawyers. We don't think... I mean, there's a particular um, skills that you pick up in other areas, particularly in criminal law, and that you're familiar with a variety of, of disciplines before you sit on the bench. And when you're on the bench, we would view it. So that, I suppose that's the law society's viewpoint, that we think you, you should be appointed as a general judge, but you're assigned to this division. And again, that can be done administratively and, and, and legislatively. But the, yeah, it's interesting that you're saying that you feel that the Department of Justice need to set a, the legislative framework in place. Because, um, I mean, there has been judicial reform by certain presidents of different courts that have allowed for uh, you know, case progression in a better way. Um, so, you know... Has, has there been a reluctance within the judiciary to actually deal with this matter themselves? No, I, uh, I, 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 to be fair, I don't, I, I don't see it as a reluctance. I mean, it, the le when you make legislation, you can also get resources allocated by reason of it being legislation. Uh, the, the, the court rules don't necessarily... Uh, don't you know that's that's a different type that's a statutory instrument so they're they're, they're kind of different functions but it, it, if you want to really make this work it is going to require a courts a family law courts act and uh, it's going to require quite specific um, uh, and detailed information in relation to that but that again I think the publication of a bill would would um, get all the stakeholders involved and would would s substantially progress it. But I mean, mm. the, the fact this committee is looking at it, at, mm. at this area has substantially progressed things. I think as well, and even uh, in, in in relation to today's hearing, there's been a huge amount of uh, of certainly new facts that uh, that have come to everybody's attention, which is hugely useful. Connor, please. I mean, to take up that point, Deputy Chambers, the, the President of the District Court has done certain things, certainly in the context of the public law child protection proceedings, uh, such as a practice direction on case management, but that only has had application in the Dublin Metropolitan District um, and to an extent to travelling judges. Um, as Keith alluded to, the President of the District Court is limited in what he or she can do uh, as, regard, uh, as regards the District Court hearing in Letterkenny or Cork or, or wherever. Mm. Uh, so uh, from that point of view, uh, you could achieve a certain amount but a, a relatively limited amount by taking that approach, that if you want to have this dealt with on a more consistent and unified basis across the system, then you do need to go down the legislative route to bring in rules that will apply in the the same way in each mm. venue. Uh, I mean, we do have a system where there's a very strong concept of judicial independence, and judges do, to an extent, operate uh, in independent kingdoms in different venues, and that is one of the reasons why we have seen uh, some of the level of inconsistency that we see in, in family law, broadly speaking. Um, and, you know, you see that as well in terms of the, the inconsistency around judicial training, that some judges are very keen to take up training in this area, some judges are not, and essentially it's very difficult at present under our current structures to insist that they do. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, if you, you tackle this on a legislative basis, then you, as, as I mentioned earlier, you could set out the characteristics of a family court uh, in, in a more structured way mm -hmm. um, that could address some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And then on the point of consistency, obviously the issue of the in camera rule was mentioned. Um, as part of that reform piece, and obviously, and, and I know when I studied family law myself, from an academic perspective, it's very difficult to find any. Mm -hmm hold the different le lettering across the whole uh, case law. Like, how do we deal with that even from an... I know you mentioned, Keith mentioned the media pers perspective and the difficulty around getting an allocation there and reporting of it, but from an academic perspective, what could the state do to have a, a more kind of collaborative, ongoing piece so that we can kind of drive consistency from the academic pillar so that um, there's greater case reporting and that would 
I suppose, promote, promote mm. consistency across the judiciary. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, Deputy Chambers. Uh, the study that I was involved in, we conducted a, a qualitative study of district court childcare proceedings, so looking at the child protection piece in particular. Um, but we ran into a lot of difficulties with the child protection, or with the in-camera rule in that study. Uh, we wrote, in fact, at the time to the Minister for Justice expressing uh, our view that the in-camera rule was having a chilling effect on that kind of research. Mm. Um, to put it at simplest, we were able to speak to the professionals, so we spoke to judges, to solicitors, to barristers, to social workers and to guardians at Lytham. We could not speak to parents or children who were involved in those proceedings. And that's obviously a very significant gap in the research that we were able to produce. But if we went down that road, we would have immediately risked being in violation of the in-camera rule. Um, and so we believe there, you know, there is an exception at the moment around courtroom observation, which is the exception under which uh, Dr. Carol Coulter has been able to uh, engage in the, the child care reporting project, where she is able to sit in the back of the court and observe proceedings and report on that. There is a similar exception around journalists, which isn't really being utilised, as we mentioned. But uh, research comes in many shapes and sizes, and things like that qualitative process of speaking to people who have been involved in proceedings or reviewing case files, for example, that kind of research is very, very difficult to conduct at present because of the nature of the in-camera rules. So it would be fantastic, and I would love to see it in this committee's report, to see a recommendation um, that that rule be made a little bit more flexible to accommodate a broader variety of research that would help to inform some of the decisions we need to make in the future. Thank you. Dr Coulter will be one of our panel Great. at our next hearing on this. Thank you, Deputy Chambers. Uh, the final speaker, Deputy Peter Fitzpatrick, please. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all here today, and uh, I'm, I'm impressed with the answers. Uh, come, come, come to family codes, there's no winner, whether it's the mum, the dad or the children. Somebody loses out, uh, and I'm no expert on, on family law. Like, like the, the, first of all, the facilities for a start is absolutely ridiculous. Like you said earlier on now, a mum or dad could walk a child in the front door. And it's a couple of hours later, either the mum or the dad would walk the child back out again. And to me, like, there's, there's no winners whatsoever. Uh, my main concern at the moment would be would be the uh, the heavy case load on the judge, and about uh, but but the judge making the right decision, because there's not a week passes my consistency office. I have a mum, I have a dad coming in, and saying that the judge is, uh, the, this judge prefers women or this judge prefers men, and and they feel as though that you know, the judge hasn't got the expertise to uh, to do the case. So I'm just asking, you, can you give me how do you, how do you find the judges? Do you find them that like you know like I'm sure a certain judge would know more about maybe an A or a B and such. But I'm just going to say, do you think the right decisions will be made by judges in general? Um, on that question, I think you've hit on a very important point, Deputy Fitzpatrick. Um, from my experience in family law cases, any, in, for example, in Kildare, there are two family law sittings a month, the first, the first and third Monday of the month. There are 80 to 100 cases listed on those days. So how a judge is expected to hear the voice of the child in every single one of those cases, it's an impossible task. You know? And that is what is leading to delays, that a judge will do the very best he or she can to deal with those cases in the best possible way. But it inevitably means that there are cases that will be adjourned, that will be put back for the next list. And each and every list is full. So the judges really have a very, very difficult position at the moment. Um, I would say that there is probably a need for more judges, that there are certainly more cases in the system, and judges should have enough time to deal with the issues properly. Uh, you indicate, please. Yeah, I just, just as you said, you know, in your, in your constituency, the you know what people, assumptions people are making are they're trying to figure out what is what is happening behind you know in the courts when they've no you know no one's able to see in. So what happens in the absence of data and the absence of research is you get a number of myths, and some of them are really really mistaken. But we don't know this until we have data. So the lack of transparency, both in terms of you know we'd really endorse what what Connor said around the qualitative, the capacity to do qualitative research to speak to. The the service users as such, the, the parents and the children, to ask them their experience afterwards, really critically important. The quantitative data is really, really critically important as well because in the absence of it, we have myths that we can't even begin to say they're right or wrong. And there's a lot of time and energy spent um, trying to understand is it, is it right or wrong that's happening inside when we simply don't have the data to make that, that Before judgment. going back to you, Deputy Fitzpatrick, just for the information of members 
We're proposing to take a group picture, if you're all happy to join us, because in the report where we're doing a publicly published report, we usually demonstrate the extent of our witness panel. So if you're happy to remain, it's just if the colleagues have left, if you want to text them to say this is happening, they're all welcome to be there. I'm really going to the picture with you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, when you're that's the way that works. <laughs> Connor, you were indicating you wish to come back just, to... Just yeah. on the question of uh, variation between judges. Uh, I mean, the evidence base is, is limited for some of the reasons I've expressed, but we do have evidence that judicial personality and judicial preferences does play a big role. That's, that's a fact. And, uh, you, you know, so just to give you an example from the project I was involved in, on the question of appointing guardians ad litem, there are some judges who almost always appoint a guardian ad litem, some judges who do it in certain circumstances, and some judges who are very slow to do it. Uh, and they do seem to have, have set preferences that, that come through very, very strongly. And one of the most interesting things that, that one judge said to us in that study uh, was uh, uh, saying, essentially, I don't know what my colleagues are doing. Uh, that they are operating in silos and not necessarily looking across other examples of practice to try and gain that consistency. They're just doing their own thing in their own area. Are there any practice directions like in the High Court? Practice directions issued for... Well, for child protection, there's the Dublin Met Metropolitan District one, uh, but that's, it's really, it's quite specific on case management okay. um, uh, and exchange of documents in advance of proceedings. Uh, beyond that, it's fairly limited, as far as I'm aware. Keep might no more. Could you anything? I don't mind. Uh, what, I mean, no, there's no problem. Oh, no, no. no, you uh, have the floor, please. No, no, no. I feel that in order to have an honest and open discussion about the reform of family law, that all stakeholders should be afforded an opportunity to participate and to be accorded parity of esteem within this process. Back to my consistency office, which I have a busy office in, in Dundalk, three fathers came in to me this week alone. And the reason the three fathers came in to me this week alone was because they realised it's coming up in the front of the Justice Committee and that just all your good selves will be here today. <coughs> uh, I just explain, they, 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 they are saying to me that their voice has been, has been muted, they feel as though they've been undervalued, and they feel that the, the fact that society is changing, that, you know, that, that fathers should play a bigger role in this. Now, I, I just said, and I just, I wrote down what, 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 what actually the father said to me. He said to me that fathers feel as though that they've been underrepresented and, and that they've been actively excluded from the decision making process in all matters pertaining to the family law. Do you feel as though the, the fa that the, these people, has, the, these stakeholders, has been omitted from the process? Keith, please. Well, I suppose, uh, I, we, I suppose we've flagged anecdotally there is a problem with fathers because of the change in society and the, the there is a much greater, I'm doing this work about 20 years, there's a much greater involvement from fathers even in that period from, from the start to now and there's also a huge change in the role of both parents anyway in terms of how involved they are with their children. Uh, w one of the real difficulties in Dublin where I practice for fathers is accommodation. Uh, the result of a judicial separation or the end of a relationship is one of the two people isn't living with the other one. And it's usually the father who's the one who's, who's living in a different accommodation. The challenge is to get accommodation that is child friendly or even capable of having an overnight with a child in Dublin at the minute unless you're on a very significant salary, are huge. If you're not living near your children, the reality is you don't see them as much and you don't have as much contact with them. I, I think the judges are, are trying to work with that and, and to some degree our system of justice is um, an adversarial one and it's up to the lawyers as well to put it up to the judges. You know, we're not an inquisitorial where the judge uh, it, it intervenes. An awful lot of family law cases are resolved by settlement, particularly judicial separation and divorce, which is where marital couples deal with um, uh, custody and access issues. Non-marital couples deal with them in the district court, which is a lot more summary justice if you like. So it really, I, I would say there's a distinction, an unfair distinction between marital and non-marital because of the venue for the proceedings and how they're dealt with and the amount of time given to them. So cases in the High Court would get the most time, the Circuit Court would, would get a bit less time and cases in the District Court get an awful lot less time. Um, uh, and that's reflected in the costs in terms of them as well. So the, the, the in-camera rule is, is unhelpful as well. But I suppose the difficulty is there's a perception that fathers should, should perhaps be happy with every second weekend and one overnight during the week. And some fathers will be happy. But for fathers who aren't happy with that kind of 
traditional model of access, um, it means that you probably have to go and get an expert report which will support your contention that you should have more access. And you can do that. And if you dig your heels in, but you have to dig your heels in a bit, and it's not automatic, you get the report and you advocate for access. But it, it can be done, and again, I think most solicitors would, would uh, push that for their clients. But it does require a push, and if you're fighting on a number of fronts in a case to do with finances, to do with maintenance, to do with the house, to do with negotiating a mortgage, your children, which may actually be the most important part of it, do sometimes got, get a bit lost in the mix. And again, you, you know, you're... You're trying to, if you're the father, you're trying to juggle a full-time job. You're trying to, to, to be dealing with your life, dealing with access, dealing with the breakdown of relationships. So you can understand why people might not push it as well. But certainly, I think what, what Ellen had mentioned in terms of this was that we do require some fairly serious quantitative research in relation to the types of access orders that are being made. And also with the... the, the if, to, to, to lift the in-camera rule to allow people who have been through the process to speak uh, to someone like Carl Coulter or other uh, independent academics uh, about their experience and that, that then the family law courts need to reflect this. Uh, there is probably a need for training in this area as well and, and, and to move it on. But it, we as practitioners, without any objective evidence based on our own cases and our own meetings, we do believe that there, there are problems for fathers and that it is harder for a father to get the access they want than, than it should be. And that, if, if it's a fair system, that's the way it works. Sorry. Cleona was indicating, please. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I, mean, I, I agree that, you know, there's changing, there's, you know, we have changing families, changing parental practices. Um, but, you know, we do have data that, that clearly looks at and measures the, the level of engagement of mothers and fathers in their children's lives in terms of care, in terms of just that, that labour. Um, so I would expect that the, that the decisions in courts um, would, would somewhat reflect that, not necessarily absolutely mirror that, because, you know, we can see that once a family uh, breaks up that there might be a change in that, in that type of pattern in terms of who's doing the primary caring. But the the issue that again I, I, I'm just to echo what Connor said there that we have you know is it the case that there are voices being muted and I think what you're hearing is that all parties are being muted here we're not hearing from all parties um, and and to to come to sort of a to to build a case and an argument on anecdotes may not be very helpful here. What we really need is the quantitative data that will allow us to actually look, say what we're looking at and, and have a conversation, because I do think we probably need a conversation about this, but until we have it in front of us, we can't have that conversation. Thank you, Cleana. Um, back to you, Deputy Fitzpatrick. Thank you. This is a question at the moment. Is, uh, do you need a solicitor for a family code? And what I mean by that there is, I believe you can represent yourself if you make an application. But you can't take anyone else in with you unless you're either a solicitor or, or, or a barrister. Like, I talked to a young lad there recently from my own tenant and dog who went to the family court and wanted to take in a friend of his to represent him, but he wasn't allowed to, uh, to take his friend in as such. And, and uh, I, I want to know, is, is, is that true? Do you have to be either a solicitor or a barrister to re represent your, either the client? With, with, with family law, um, the proceedings are heard in private. Yes. You know, and that is why your constituent wasn't able to bring his friend in with him. They are the current rules. Um, I think I said earlier that it, you know, a person is quite entitled to represent themselves in court, and very often they do because of the delays in terms of getting a legal aid. Um, there are many reasons why people represent themselves in court, but um, certainly, I suppose, to preserve the sanctity and the importance of family law proceedings, the alternative might very well be that if everybody was walking in and sitting in on family law proceedings, that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be optimum either. No, also, uh, sorry, go they go called it a Mackenzie friend, which is somebody who may be able to assist the person in, in, in terms of dealing with them. That, that, so there, there is a provision uh, potential for that. Uh, but I suppose the difficulty also is what's the effect on the other person in the court if you're, if you're bringing in friends or relations as well. So there's a, there's a balance that a judge would, ha would have to strike 
in, in, in those types of proceedings uh, as to how they, they can deal with the in-camera rule and how they are going to enforce it. It's just that the person, whether it's, whether it's the, mom, the mom or the dad, is just basically just can't afford to get a, to get a solicitor. And in, in fairness, like, uh, like, I'm just going to say it's the, it's the right thing because a lot of, a lot of people would, would go in and could be very nervous with the solicitor or the barrister and they'd feel a wee bit safer if they had someone beside them that they'd actually know as such. And I don't think either, I don't think the other, the other, the other half would have a, actually a problem with that there, because normally it wouldn't be a member of a family. That it'd, be, it'd be someone who maybe who, who had similar experience that happened something before, and maybe he's trying to help the person themselves to, you know, to get to, get the things sorted out. Like as I said earlier on, the most important thing is for the child to be sorted out. But I'm just going to say, I, I, can't, I, I know it's in the close room and that there. I just can't understand how someone can take someone else in with them to, to help them along the way, because. There is an awful lot of, of, of nervous individuals that likes to have someone, a kind of a comfort zone beside them there to head along. And I just, I, personally, I just think, to me, it doesn't seem fair. I, I think it, it comes back to the strict application of the in-camera rule, because that concept of a Mackenzie's friend, the person who isn't representing you but is supporting you uh, in a normal civil proceeding, that's something which can happen. But if you interpret the in-camera rule strictly, which we tend to do in family cases in this country, then that person uh, is not a party to the proceedings, nor are they a legal representative, and therefore the in-camera rule kicks in, essentially. So, I mean, I, I've, I've encountered the, the precise situation you described. I have encountered that myself as well, where, where uh, somebody had, uh, had a person to accompany them who was asked to leave by the judge. Yeah. And I think that is, it's the, the way the in-camera rule is applied. Let's go back and talk about legal, legal aid, because uh, you mentioned means test, that it's means test in that area. And I can't understand the way it's means test, because if you look, for example, here, in a TD in the doll there recently, was able to get legal aid, and in fairness, us TDs are pretty well paid. So I can't understand how, uh, how a mum or a dad to just can't afford to get a solicitor or a barrister can't go away and get legal aid. It's, there seems to be two different things between a, a, a different, you know, family court and other courts. Can you explain to me that, no? I can explain the legal aid system very briefly to you. That, uh, the legal aid system is based on your income, but it's also weighted that you might get some um, uh, payments t or some credit if you have a mortgage. If you're the, the person who's looking after the... If you're the primary uh, carer of the children. So uh, it, it depends not just on how much you earn, but also on the outgoings and what's, what they're for. Uh, but also, there's some... I mean, most legal aid is means-tested, but again, it depends... Uh, on the, the urgency of it. But it generally is, it's a very bureaucratic system to get through the hoops of get, submitting all your financial documentation and being put on a waiting list. So uh, I think, I don't think anybody could disagree with the but that more people should be eligible for free legal aid in the Legal Aid Board. Uh, but they do, a, a, they're fairly rigorous because they've been judicially reviewed a number of times about how they, they conduct uh, their means testing. So uh, certainly my uh, dealing with it on behalf of clients or, or, or witnessing in practice, and I worked as a solicitor for the legal, or I worked for the Legal Aid Board uh, for, for, for a while as well. So in practice, it seems to me, when you're inside the system, it seems very difficult to, to actually get through the hoops of, of getting legal aid. So it is, it is a difficult thing to get, unfortunately. Well, you said you would understand. There was another, another member oh, wished to answer your previous question. Caroline, please. Oh, no, it's just really only going to row in behind something which Keith said earlier. You have to, something to the effect you have to, if a judge is faced with a request to allow a Mackenzie friend in a family um, law case, he or she has to think very carefully about the rights of the other person. I can easily envisage a situation where the other person themselves might be unrepresented and might feel or be particularly vulnerable and sometimes might experience the Mackenzie friend, especially if the Mackenzie friend is, um, seems to be dominating the proceedings by taking inordinate lengths of time to whisper instructions or advice or whatever in the other person's ear. It might actually, I can envisage a situation where they might experience that as quite intimidating um, and you wonder there about equality of arms and, and all that. So. I think it's a, a tricky situation with Mackenzie Friend in a family law um, setting. Personally, I'd be happier with everybody being represented by a competent lawyer who, after all, has professional responsibilities, not just to the client but to the court and to their own professional body. If they misbehave, there are sanctions, and I just wonder... 
Mackenzie Friend, uh, with great respect to them, and I'm sure there may, very many of them are very responsible and very um, uh, good people, but all the same, I, I would rather know that anybody who was there representing or assisting somebody in court um, did have some training and did have some professional um, structure around them. So, Keith, you wish to come back. I'm just going to follow up on that to, to say I think Connor is correct there in terms of the the reality is that while Mackenzie friends are notionally possible in family law cases, the reality is I, I know of very few district court judges or, or circuit court judges who would permit a, a Mackenzie friend uh, to, to go to court because of the in camera rules. So the reality is, although notionally you might be able to have a Mackenzie fr friend, in practice the interpretation and because of the severity of the in camera rule in Ireland, you, you're right, uh, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, you won't be able to get somebody into court unless they're a lawyer or they're a party to the case. Yeah. Patrick. Uh, I think what I'll do, I'll, I'll put my last two questions together here. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm being told. That when, when, when you get a solicitor for family law, it could cost hundreds, it could cost thousands, it could cost tens of thousands. And I believe that the solicitors are, are obliged at the time uh, to give in writing to the clients the cost of, of the procedure. And I'm just wondering if it's to the Law Society, is that actually happening there at the moment? Is So our, our solicitors, when they do meet the clients, are they, are they sending out information on the breakdown of the actual cost? That's one question. And, and the last question then is, uh, the Law Society says that the fees must be reasonable for the work undertaken, and if they're not happy, you can make a, you can make a complaint to the Law Society. I'm just saying that at the moment, is there many complaints to the Law Society about the cost of, from, for solicitors and barristers? The first one, there's section 68 of the 1994 Solicitors Act uh, dictate that uh, solicitors must, as soon as practicable after taking instructions, uh, set out the basis for their costs. That doesn't mean, say, exactly how much they are, but it sets out what what is what roughly is the basis for their costs. That could be an hourly charge. It could be to say that, look, I would normally charge this much, but if this happens, it might be something else. So it's not a precise estimate. It's simply to, to set out the basis for the costs. This is going to change radically in the coming months when Section 150 of the Legal Services Regulatory, the Legal Services Act, comes into effect because there's going to be a much more detailed um, estimate of solicitors' costs and barristers' costs required at the beginning of the case. So uh, currently the system is a, a little bit more general, but it's going to get much, much more precise when the Legal Services Regulatory Authority um, brings in their complaints uh, aspect. And remember, the Legal Services Regulatory Authority are an independent body, separate from the Law Society, separate from solicitors, which was set up by the government uh, to deal with this. So there's going to be a much... Currently there's a, a reasonably... Um, a broad range of, of ways you can satisfy the cost requirement and the estimate, but it's going to get much, much more precise for solicitors and much better for consumers when this section 150 comes in. So that's the current position. Uh, the second one is, um, I think your second question was in relation to... Complaints. Uh, complaints. The, the level of complaints the Law Society is at one of its, I think, all-time low lows currently and there are some complaints about costs but they're historically I think they're at at, at one of their lowest levels uh, uh, in relation to costs and other issues as well costs are only one of the the, the, the issues that that people may complain about solicitors uh, Okay. Yes, please. Could I just add one thing to what Keith has said there, particularly in the context of what we have discussed today, and given the delays, that if a solicitor has to go to court on Monday, that will cost a certain amount. But if there are constant adjournments, that is inevitably going to add to the cost. So if we could, if, if the system could be improved, I firmly believe that the cost will come down, that if a solicitor is in court just one day instead of four days, that makes a huge difference. More judges. Need more judges. Okay, Deputy Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, we have done, I think, a mighty job of work here this morning. It's the first, as I've said, of three uh, special hearings that the committee will undertake in relation to this matter. Um, I had referenced uh, Dr. Coulter earlier coming in our next sitting. It's not next week. We have to deal with the Brexit uh, legislation uh, next week with the Minister for Justice is the following week, the 6th of March. 
and I think the 13th of March then is also set for the next two hearings in relation to this matter. I, I'd just like to say that we hope to see you all back because we will be doing a public launch of our report and fingers crossed, touch wood, maybe before the summer recess that we, we might get there. We'll we see. might there. I'm pushing and plugging a little bit. Uh, it will be good to have it done within that time frame. Um, but we will be back inviting you all to come back for that occasion. And if you're not in a position to, we'll certainly send you all a copy. And we want to thank you very much for your input, as I've said earlier, in relation to your uh, written submissions. But uh, not only even the opening statements, but the quality of the responses from all of you to the questions posed by my colleagues on the committee. Uh, it's been hugely helpful and informative. And um, thank you so much for that. So to Saoirse and Julie, to Keith and Helen, to Clean and Caroline, and to Connor. I can't do the deputy's accent, but uh, you don't seem to have won yourself as strong as his. So. <laughs> but we want to thank you all very, very much indeed. And I'd now like to invite you to join us for a little group photograph just outside. So the Joint Committee is adjourned until 9am on Wednesday the 27th of February. Gorham